So, um, Tommy, I gave you top billing, but if you don't mind, I want to pivot for a second here. The kind of pivot that Joel Jerome Powell can't do. I want to pivot to our good mutual friend, John Roke. Um, but neither Tom nor John need an introduction. But, John, the reason I'm going to let you butt in here is because the inspiration for this, the title of this from, is you're solely responsible for it. For those of you who wouldn't know this, but John and I did a, uh, we, we, we did a co-keynote speech uh, at the CMT conference at the end of April. And John had used When Doves Cry, I think, in one of his research pieces. And we tried to use the uh, video uh, in our in leading to our presentation, but the audio visual was, was messed up. Up. So, John, you're getting another you're getting another crack at the back. I want to want to thank you for the idea. And um, so, John, you if, uh, you you two guys can just pick straws. Here. Whoever wants to start off, uh, John, do you want to go first, or Tommy, you want to go first? It doesn't matter to me if Tommy wants to bat lead off like Ricky Henderson. It's fine with me. No, Tommy, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Tom, yeah, John, John, why, why, hear... why, why don't you lead off since you inspired that you were the inspiration for the run? Okay, um, quite a day. Very busy. Um, I think it was the day that uh, finally the market uh, started to listen to what Powell had to say. He was very serious, um, direct. I think it was about seven minutes. And he addressed a lot of different things. He mentioned the word pain. He also uh, discussed how it's most likely that you're going to see the unemployment or employment uh, change didn't say that you're going to see that uh, in those, those many words, but uh, he implied that. And that's what uh, is planning on what, what is ahead for the markets in the world, the U.S. Um, you know, the markets ignored a lot over the last few weeks uh, after earnings. And earnings were the better than feared earnings reports. And what happened after that was we saw... Well, first of all, go back to early June. You saw some gap downs in the market. And those days, the prime brokers uh, came out and said that they've never seen this much shorting um, across the board. And that that was really a ill-timed short for a lot of hedge funds. And then as the market started to rebound uh, in late July and, and August, all those shorts really started to cover. And the prime brokers also said that they've seen, you know, massive amounts of covering. And on top of it, uh, I think in the Bank of America fund manager survey, uh, it was really evident that uh, they were chasing technology. The inflows into tech were huge. And so you had a lot of people trapped uh, at the recent highs. And we, you know, you can look at the 200 day moving average. It doesn't necessarily mean everything, but it was just a line that the market decided to stop at. Uh, so you had really no shorts. You had a lot of people trapped and it's summer. There's very, it's a very illiquid market. So you had breath today. I'm just looking at the closing breath stats. Um, well, all 30 Dow stocks were down. You had five S and P stocks up. That's not good. Um, and the Russell, the Russell 2000 had 92 stocks out of 2000 and 109, excuse me, 110 in the Russell 3000. So breath was absolutely horrible. But the, the, the thing that uh, Powell is trying to do is he's trying to uh, tighten financial conditions and financial conditions. Uh, one of the big factors is the stock market. And so he really needed to come out and be hawkish. He had a lot of people that said, oh, he's going to be hawkish, but buy the market. Uh, he was serious today. And I think that uh, the market finally took him at his word. I think the, piv the pivot talk, uh, which was ridiculous, uh, that's over. Uh, credit spreads have been uh, tightening or, excuse me, widening. And Harnett at B of A said to watch on investment grade uh, 100 and in the U.S. and 125 in Europe. Those were the recent highs or wides. Uh, so we have jobs data next Friday. We're expecting 300,000 uh, down from 471. I still think 300,000 is a big number. Uh, the market may think, oh, well, we're slowing. But I think that number is going to get a lot worse. And the CPI, which we don't have any reading on, but I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to go out and say that we're going to have an eight handle in the CPI.
So it's just an ugly market. Uh, I think the market, uh, again, illiquid market. We'll see what happens next week. Uh, still very you know quiet. I reached out to a bunch of people to see if they want to join, and I had a lot of people saying that they're on the beach. So it's uh, that type of market, but it's ugly. And I'll let uh, my friend John Roke, who, when I met him in 2000, I was living in Los Angeles, and one of the coolest things is I was on the buy side and he was on the sell side. And he's like, well, instead of going out to dinner, let's go to a Dodger game. And he would, he took me to a Dodger game and um, he just gave me all this good baseball trivia all night. And uh, from there, that was where our friendship began. So, John, uh, why don't you go? And, 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 and Tommy, Tommy. Just, just so you know, John is a multi-sport uh, athlete. Um, he and I, have, in fact, we attended a game in the NBA Finals against your beloved Lakers, Thornton. So there, R- R- Roke and I. So We did. I don't know, yeah, John, I don't know. What, what, what's, what's your fave, ba- baseball or basketball? Is that changed? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm loyal to baseball, but I love hoops. I'm, so uh, you, you got both counts. There you go. Take it away, John. Okay, thanks very much. And Tom, thanks. Always a pleasure to hear you. And George, thanks for your, um, for your kind introduction and for inviting me. Okay, so I'll, I'm just going to back into this. Um, So at the latter part of last year, I thought that we had made the cycle highs for the major indexes. And my downside target for the S&P was 3,600, and we got pretty darn close. And then in a note in late June, I had sent the clients, it was entitled Yogi Berra said, I thought that we could have a bear market rally. And I thought we'd probably get to about 4,100, 4,200. And we got above there to 4,300, which was the downward sloping 200-day moving average. Uh, I'm going to I'm not going to dismiss the the 200 day moving average and its slope because the slope is key. Please consider the, the, the 200 day moving average and its slope, either the demand line for the market or the supply line for the market. And this is the way I think about it. When the index is joined by an upward sloping 200 day moving average and it corrects to or just below it and that slope of that 200 day is still upward, then demand is greater than supply. However, when the index or an item gets below its 200-day moving average and that 200-day moving average starts to change slope from up to down and rallies get capped at or near the downward sloping 200-day moving average, then that remains the supply line for the item that we're measuring. And clearly, supply here is overwhelming demand for the major indexes and particularly the S&P 500. While it did rally over the past several weeks, and that was a big rally. It was not small. It went from 3,636 to 4,300, which is a big move. It was 19% in 40 days. However, you got to your most overbought reading ever on a daily MACD. Now, I know this is an arithmetic, not a percentage MACD. However, I'm measuring it over the last year versus comparable numbers. So the most recent rally that took us up 19% over 40 days created the greatest overbought we've ever seen. And I know just let's use recent numbers. So I thought that it was kind of ridiculous or at least difficult to chase the market that was overbought below a downward sloping 200 day moving average and had created its greatest ever overbought ever uh, um, in history. So I thought those things didn't work. And then there was, I I must say, I'm going to be a little bit critical, not to anybody personally, but just to a message in general. There was a lot of technical Let's say um, I'll I'll just go soft here. A lot of technical baloney that went around over the prior few weeks where people said, oh, if you got a Fibonacci retracement of this much, you have always made the low and you never went back down again. And I thought that was really just a a lot of baloney. You got a 76 percent retracement from what was February into March. That didn't work. And from the June low to now, you got a 62% retracement. And so far, that's uh, we don't know if that's worked yet. Maybe, maybe not. But you had bear market rallies in 1990, 94. Then you had all the way down 2000, 2001, 2002, and then in 2008. And really, the lows were not in, and the investors cannot sing Kumbaya again until you got back above the 200-day moving average, and it sloped upward. And we're not close to that happening. In addition, and we know that history never repeats in detail, the current oversold reading on a weekly basis for the S&P is six months long. 
in the GFC, you were oversold for 18 months. And, of course, we know in the big one, in the tech uh, decline, you were oversold for 31 months. So just because you're oversold doesn't mean you have to get out. And the inability to get out from a big oversold just tells you how weak we are. So um, the weekly momentum uh, with two E's is probably putting in a peak here or has put in a peak. And we're going to continue to stay oversold. And I thought it was pretty interesting this week. If you pay attention, and I know everybody on this call likely does, there were a few things that kind of made me um, a little bit cautious from a sentiment standpoint. Number one, it kind of bothers me that Jackson Hole is more important than Bo Jackson. I thought, think we were healthier market-wise when we knew more about Bo Jackson than we did about the Jackson Hole Annual Economic Policy Symposium. But it's not just about the symposium that really got me thinking about this. It's angst over positioning every time the Super Bowl of economics approaches. And so I'm going to give you another example. Today, Jay Powell said we must keep at it until the job is done. And I'm sure, because I heard it at least once afterward, that the Federal Reserve speech parsers are now going to tell you that that's not what he really meant. It reminds me of us, all of us, watching the Super Bowl and somebody, as the game is just starting, says, who do you think the Giants are going to draft in the spring? And I'd look at him and I'd say, we haven't even finished the season yet. And we're looking about the draft in the spring. Can't we just watch the Super Bowl and enjoy it? And I think that's what we do in the business. We become a smattering or, or a look into what social media is. Everybody wants to be first. And that's more important than being thoughtful about what we're talking about. In addition, this week, Raphael Bostic, who is the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta president, said when asked about whether the Fed should increase rates by 50 or 75 basis points, he said, at this point, I toss a coin between the two. I don't know about you guys, but that doesn't make me feel any better about what these guys are doing at the Fed. And then... Lastly, before I turn it back to George, I don't know if anybody else saw this, but it was on Bloomberg yesterday that a buy the dip fund seeks to seize on liquidity voids and market panic. This is from Bloomberg. It says uh, BTD, buy the dip capital fund, symbol dip, extra points for them being clever, will invest primarily in S&P 500 companies of any market cap that have been identified as oversold through a proprietary algorithm. And so my question is, what happens when the algorithm shows that it's oversold and it stays oversold? I think people aren't yet ready to answer that question. And we're seeing that, especially if you look at weekly charts. George, back to you. Thanks for listening. Thanks, John. Thanks, Tommy. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, you can observe a lot, uh, deduce a lot from uh, what's going on on Twitter with the Twitter mobs. And... I think it was about a week or two ago. I started getting people dunking on me because I overstayed my welcome on the uh, bearish side, perhaps. But I gotta give a lot of credit to, uh, to to Tommy in particular, who has this nasty habit of dumpster diving, but calling these turns correctly. And he, he, and, and, he and, and Tommy, I, I salute you for being, you know, trying to capture that actually on the long side. But it's kind of interesting to listen to the tone, the chatter. John, it's like in baseball. You know, I've talked about this a lot. It's like, hey, about it, about it, about it. You know, uh, what's the trash talk coming from from, from the from, from the visitors uh, from the opposing team's dugout? And you know, I've been a couple spaces. So, 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 George, can I People jump in sort right of obliquely. there? Yeah, go, yeah, go, go, go. Go okay, for it, John. Okay, so um, it was two days ago. Two days ago, I sent out a note to clients entitled "Voice of God," and if you're, you know, kind of in, um, uh, if you're of a certain age. Uh, you'll probably remember that John Facenda was the NFL films narrator, and he kind of was referred to referred to as the voice of God. And he, um, many people will tell you, was really responsible for mythologizing the NFL and creating this tremendous, you know, gladiator aspect, which built the fan base. But I thought that the voice of God was appropriate because I was watching CNBC earlier um, that same day, and a longtime seasoned uh, market commentator and market analyst was asked about the market. And the guest said that he thought that the recent rally was well supported by internal dynamics and that he was made more bullish because he, the guest, could divine no apparent narrative 
to support the rally. Now, to be sure, I thought the latter part of his statement was a bit out of touch. And if the voice of God, John Facenda, who died in 1984, were going to narrate a market low light film, because there are a lot of low lights here, there are not many highlights, he would have said the following in his voice of God. The only narrative evident in the market currently is that the Fed will not be as onerous on their rate hike journey and that they are close to pivoting. There is no other narrative. And I think that was evident today because Powell told you there is no narrative of that sort. He made it plain. And I think that's why you saw us come down 4% on NASDAQ because he told you explicitly that's not the narrative. But I think that's what most people were looking for. And that's why we had rallied so much over those 40 days. Well said, John. So one of the data points I wanted to cite, um, this is from a couple of weeks, about 10 days ago. Um, it appeared, I think, on Zero Hedge or whatever, some, some short covering data from uh, Goldman Sachs Prime Brokerage. Uh, and I quote, the latest short covering has been extreme. As Goldman outlines, on a percentage basis, the cumulative 20-day covering from July 20 to August 16th is very large and ranks in the 99th percentile, 99th percentile. All right. Um, I mean, these are things that you don't see at um, at, at bottoms. Um, similarly, um, the, the the index of uh, the Goldman most shorted basket. Um, again, this is from around the same date. Um, S while the S&P's gained 15 percent from its June low, the Goldman Sachs basket of most shorted stocks is up 45 percent at one time. But short covering rally seems to be over the time being. I think this was this was uh, written uh, about, about a week ago. At any rate, um, it's when you see this sort of behavior and you listen to you observe the chatter uh, from Twitter mobs, um, you get a sense of a sense of where you are. And um, you know, the thing is, when the only real buyer, when you have people renting exposure um, just because things are going up and to the right, when you have shorts being squeezed. It's a very good indicator uh, kind of where you are. And, and, and the nasty thing is, we all know this, when the shorts are done covering, watch out. And I kind of think that's where we are right now. I'd also observe sentiment, and this is both for Thomas and for, for John, whoever wants to weigh in on this. I don't have the exact number. I know, Tommy, you follow sentiment pretty carefully. But I recall about a week ago, I think the CNN, CNN in many ways can measure sentiment. They all kind of say the same thing. I don't get too wrapped up in sentiment because there's been a tremendous misuse of it. But I think I recall the CNN indicator got up to around 51 or something like that. But more importantly, um, maybe for both of you, you could speak about sentiment as you see it, where it's been, where it is. And also, there's such misuse of sentiment that sentiment measures, ranges of sentiment measures in bear markets tend to be much different in bull markets. So, for instance, the CNN indicator, you know, it might not go down much below 40 in a, in a, bear, in a bull market, and then it cycles back up to the 90s. Equally, perhaps in a bear market, you know, it can get down to zero or 10 and it only goes to 50 or 60. You guys study this for a living, you know, it better than I. So maybe you could just weigh in on how you see sentiment and also how the sentiment regime varies depending on what type of market you're, market you're in. So I don't know who wants to take that first. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, you know what happens? Uh, well, first of all, sentiment is not a trigger. There's a lot of there are a lot of people that will cite some sentiment indicator uh, at some point and say, oh, it's never been this low or it's this low and you got to buy in bear markets and bear mark or in bull markets uh, sentiment can stay uh, depressed in a bear market for quite a while and uh, extended in a bull market for quite a while. And, and you just need triggers to turn that. Uh, we're currently in a regime that uh, you're going to see sentiment go up to around 50 percent on the let's say the fear and greed. Uh, the other one I use is the Daily Sentiment Index. That went up just a little over, um, uh, just over fifty uh, percent, and then uh, it came back, came down. So it can stay in these ranges. Like the U.S. dollar has been in an extended sentiment range on the upside for a year now, and that's a bull market in the U.S. dollar. Uh, I, I think also uh, regarding just anecdotal stuff. I somehow uh, triggered, I, I did a tweet on Bed Bath & Beyond and, on, and oh my God, I had to, to uh, I deleted it because I just got such abuse. And, you know, naturally it goes down 50% the next day, but it's just unbelievable how much faith people have in crappy stocks 
and how much faith people had in buying companies like NVIDIA that just guided down another billion dollars, which they guided down a billion and a half just a couple months ago. So it's just amazing that perhaps we're coming to a realization that things are not going to remain so great. And so that's sort of my, my two cents on current sentiment. John? Okay, so uh, number one, the, the VIX recently was down at 20. That would not evince fear. Number two is put calls are not particularly high. Um, uh, that's, that's number two. Uh, the 10-day the, the moving average of put calls is spot 96. It's, it's not even one. I know the, intra uh, the daily number got to one spot 07 today. But in, in June, at the lows, the daily number got to about almost one spot four, and the 10-day moving average was one spot one zero. So we're not close to those levels. And, and I, I think that the sentiment indicators are somewhere on your balance sheet, but they're not a panacea. And in addition, it was a little bit hard for me to believe um, as I heard over these past several weeks that hedge funds were in, quote, short technology stocks when they were long them all the way down into the June lows. They may have reduced their positions, but it would be hard for me to believe that those folks who had such a tough time uh, being long those stocks uh, from the peak into the June lows had switched their positioning entirely to be short them. So I I'm a little dubious on what we hear anecdotally with respect to sentiment. I tend to think about it like this. Um, the, the pain is never to the upside. The pain is always to the downside. The business is built up. So there is a natural bullish bias. But we can create any narrative we want if we believe the market's going to go up. As Steve showed me, uh, Steve Chauvin, pardon me, Steve Chauvin taught me a long time ago, uh, strong items will go up for any reason, real or ephemeral. And we've seen over time when you're in an uptrend, that is true. But when you're in a bear market, it is the exact opposite of a bull market. Things that are normally seen as, as good news, they come out to be bad news. And things that are bad news make it even worse. So I don't think sentiment's washed out here because there's too much riding on us doing better. Too much. And, and, number, and number two is, and I don't mean to be uh, overly critical here or mean about it, but I don't know that there's been any hedge funds shut down. I know Melvin did, but that was a function of what occurred last year. That was already in the works. But despite the fact that these name funds, and you know them as well as I do, lost a boatload, I don't know that anybody shut down here. If they do, then maybe that'll be a signpost. But I don't think it's happened yet. Yeah, John, on that last point, um, I think, and again, Wayne Gretzky, please call your office. Let's go to where the puck's going, not where it is. I think a feature of the second half of this year, not just the obvious tax law selling that lies in front of us, but you're going to see a torrent, a tidal wave, a tsunami. Yeah, that's pretty good, all of the tea. A tidal wave of redemptions for hedge funds. Um, and then speaking to positioning, um, you know, and there are a lot of charts out about this. It's just mind boggling. Shrub's not in the room today, but looking at the flow data, I mean, you know, the public, they hardly sold a darn thing over the first few months of this year. And then they're foaming at the mouth, at, at the mouths in Pavlovian fashion in the last few weeks. The money comes piling in again. So you're saying there's a chance. You know, they can't stand to miss a good party. You know, institutional exposures, yes, they've come down. But I think a lot of that prime brokerage data is so misleading. You know, they, they I look at some JPM data the other day. And they said, well, you know, in Goldman, it's all the same thing. Funds have degrossed. They're not as long as they were. They're not as invested as they were. That's comparing the exposures to over the period of the last three years which, you know, was a regime unlike any other we've seen in financial history. If you go back and look over the past decade, you know, if 50% net long is the new flat, well, okay, then then maybe I got some re-education to do. Um, I'd like to move. We've got, by the way, this is the most unbelievable room. Um, th thank you, John. Thank you, Tyler. Just, just look around. And we've got to Dr. Nassau Haji. We've got Jeff Garbaz who's going to speak in a minute. George, Duke can Bird. I just add one more yeah, thing please. before, before go for I, 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 um, I want to listen to the other guys? I think it's important for all of us to consider what we actually witnessed for Apple over the past several weeks. Now, we all know that Apple is the biggest stock in the S&P, the biggest stock anywhere. It's 7% of the index. But as Apple rallied from what was its low in mid-June up until what was recently the August high, which was a 37% uh, rally on a, on, on a price basis, it had added more market cap more market cap than every stock in the S&P 500, not named Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, or Tesla. So that's 
So I think that's the sort of environment we're in, where, where we're seeing these extraordinary things hap happen. We don't have great precedent for it, but I don't necessarily think that it's a tremendously health healthy thing for the environment or the market when one stock could add market cap greater than 498 of the other stocks in the S&P 500. That's insane, John. And John, just to repeat the counter, the counter trend rally stats, which I always uh, repeat that you, you put the chart out earlier this year. I got it right. You'll correct me. But from memory, as I recall, you, 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 you displayed how in the 2000, 2002 bear market, when NASDAQ fell 80%, as I recall, NASDAQ, I think, was up in 47% of those trading days. You had 10 rally, counter trend rallies over 15%, 15 counter trend rallies over 10%. How does this counter trend rally fit in that context? So we were up 19% over 40 days. Uh, and I'll tell you, back then, for the period you just identified, um, the NASDAQ had a 36-day rally where it got 41% from May 24th through July 17th. It was up, you know, 21 days and it got 21%, which was the following rally. And then you had a 33-day rally where you got 44%. And then followed by a 75-day rally where you got 50%. So there were a lot of big rallies then. Ultimately, those rallies uh, d led to another decline. You didn't really make the low until after what was the 15th rally. But you're right. If you just coin flipped it, you were close to being up or down on any one day. There was really no... A uh, uh, strong way to play it on a daily basis, although the trend was lower for that entire time. Thanks, Sean. Let's go to Thanks. Jeff Carbaz, and then Jeff, after you, Jeff, let's go back to Tommy. Jeff, for you. Hey, George, how are you? So let, let's let's start. You and I talked a couple of days ago, and we actually talked about a little bit of this stuff. So your point about the uh, the prime broker data, um, I basically agree a thousand percent because it's a subset of like people that are custody to Goldman or Morgan Stanley. And there's a certain um, group think that exists within that. Like as an example, um, all the tiger guys and related are basically always been at Morgan Stanley for the most part. So there's going to be a bit of group think that kind of relates to that. So that's why I think the, the bigger numbers are more important. And I had given you some data, which I've got here. Um, we have come off a good amount. Um, our short intensity level on sectors, we had 16 sectors out of the 24 above 50% intensity. The highest it ever gets typically is like 65%. Uh, but at the end of, uh, uh, from the end of June till now, now we have none above uh, 50% with the latest data that we got two days ago. And we've dropped about 800 million shares on New York Stock Exchange since the end of June. And NASDAQ has dropped a little over a billion shares, but we're still a, a couple billion higher than we were when we started at the low, which is back in uh, February of, uh, of, 20, of 21. Um, what's, what's so interesting about, George, you used the word tsunami a little bit ago. <laughs> and we have a really cool thing we do. It's, it's called the long short tsunami. So the whole idea is to look at what hedge funds are long versus what they're short and figure out if they're getting off sides and losing money. And, and last week was horrific for that. And, it's, and it falls in the category. Typically, the reason long short funds lose money is the longs go up, but the shorts go up a lot more. And, and last week was totally counter to that. The short squeezes, um, which are doing well technically, they lost 6.87% last week and then the short squeezes where the shorts had been right they lost 4.67 percent so and since the second half of the year since starting in july um six we've had two four six seven weeks four of the seven weeks have been long short tsunami weeks so they're getting they're getting their butts kicked um you and i were talking about that even if it isn't coming out i i'm gonna love to see what the uh, what the August numbers are going to look like now that we've kind of had this, you know, almost 4% down day and we'll see how it continues or doesn't continue next week. Um, so this is exactly, George, what we talked about at the end of July. Um, you know, going into August, um, you asked me how my confidence was 
<laughs> or how worried I was. And I said, on a scale from one to 10, I was a 15. And, and it was amazing. I had someone give me shit about the fact that like, I was off on that. Well, yeah, I was off by like seven or eight days. And now it's, it's looking pretty prescient, which is that if we had all the short covering that we did, and now we've got the potential for a lot more type fours, which are weak technically, and no one is short over type threes, which is heavily shorted and lots of shorts, that makes the downside much more of an elevator ride when you got a lot more type fours. Um, so to me, this is like, uh, this is what I, we talked about. And I'm like, uh oh, this isn't good. Yeah, no, hundred percent, hundred percent, Jeff. 100%. Having having said that, one last quickie. Today today is a bit of an anomaly, and I'm going to run the numbers while we're talking. But I took we we put a screen out every week of like our favorite short squeeze ideas and our favorite long squeeze ideas. And um, so as the week played out, Monday we were down 1.17 on the longs versus the shorts. Tuesday it was minus 60 basis points. Wednesday it was down 10 basis points. Yesterday the rally we were up 87. It's because the long side was beating the short side. And then today, boom, complete rip the other way. So I got out like at 3.15. I said, I'm just going to cash on the list. We'll, we'll reevaluate next week because we're up like 1.2%. And the list finished through the close up 1.5%. So like the long names were down 1.49 for the week. And the short names were down 2.80. So basically, the pukage that occurred today was the opposite of what we typically see on a day like today. Typically, on a, when, when we start to fall apart, human nature, and, and I'd like John and Tom to weigh in on this. I think they'll probably agree. <clears throat> human nature is to sell your winners first. But we, we really didn't see that today. We saw it puking of really bad names. Like my best short name, uh, for the week, was, it was uh, Cooper, COO. It was down 6.46 for the week. So um, that that's a little bit against what I just said. But I got to look at the full universe. I mean, I'm looking at a universe of like, you know, 12 names on one side and 10 names on the other. Um, and I'll give you what the, the final numbers look like today and, and how much we dropped. But um, I would expect that today would have seen more of the stronger names dropping more. But if I'm seeing that, then that tells me uh, one of my clients said this to me because he's been trained well over time. And he's like, he's like, so what do you think? Some tax selling here today? And like, that's definitely a possibility. Yeah. Um, uh, know, Jeff, right yeah. Hey, yeah. Jeff, Jeff, one thing. The strong names did go down today really, really hard. I mean, I had all my mega cap tech uh, uh, custom yeah. indices, the Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon down four and a quarter percent. The but those aren't, ones. Tom, Tom, those aren't strong names in our world. Yeah, yeah, no, well, I, okay, on, I know on, what I'm saying. On, but those on, are the ones from sentiment view. Those are the ones that people are jammed into. And yeah. that, and you know, considering the NASDAQ 100, you know, pretty much th those were a little bit heavier than the NASDAQ 100. So I just, look, and, and Jeff, I you and I are we, have, we have opposite definitions of, of yeah, guys, 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 yeah. guys, 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 guys. Sorry, we're arguing. Yeah, yeah, let's just hold this line of discussion. I want to bring others in. We got a group. This is the most, um, look around you. Just look at this room. This is, ugh, this has got a, we may have broken the record for the best room ever here with with the with, with, with the quality of the intellect in this room. I want to work others in here. So let's just hold that conversation. I want to go to Cantro and then Michael Belkin and then KFAB. Cantro, what's up, man? Hey, George. Hey, you put the honey out. The bears are going to come for a uh, feeding. <laughs> Cantro, uh, Cantro, not like you're interrupting your vacation or anything and your wife's not yelling at you because you're, you're on Twitter. Go ahead. <laughs> um. So yeah, from a 100,000 foot view, I, I think the, the real bear market uh, it started in the middle of June, right when the market bottomed. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but you know, if we think about why the market rallied, is because the data was terrible, oil got clocked, bond yields originally came down, and people misinterpreted Jay Powell. And so I see this last two months of a market rally as ironically, the market celebrating the onset of a recession via, again, Inflation's peak, Fed's done, all that, which is clearly not the case after today. Um, and so what, what, I, what I mean by a proper bear market is if you look at 2008 and really 
just about all of the major bear markets that we're all familiar with, especially those two recent ones, they began not with a 30% drop in the PE of the market, but they began when earnings estimates started to decline. If you, look, if you literally look at the peak of the market in 07, and in the ultimate peak of the market, kind of September-ish, at least the S&P, in 2000, things really started going to shit when earnings estimates started declining. And so that only started, and it's been minimal, two months ago. And so... I, I wouldn't call what we've been through kind of a, a I don't want to, I don't want to mix, mix words here, but like a proper bear market. To me, a proper bear market is one that, you know, one, one that we're all familiar with and we like to model and we try to make analogs from. Most of those are earnings bear markets. And so I think the street is confused um, because we are in the midst of a rate driven bear market that is colliding slowly with an earnings driven bear market. And people are applying all of these traditional earnings bear market stories to the narrative. Uh, a lot of this, you know, a lot of the stuff that was on all over Twitter and the news last week about the 50% retracement. And I'm curious to hear what Rogue says about this, um, you know, and how that's never failed as a new bull market indicator. And I don't think actually, you know, it came out that that's not entirely true, but we'll just pretend it is. If you look at the dates of all the bottoms in all of those markets, they were all right smack in the beginning of major economic upturns. Every single one of them. Specifically, you can look at the NHB or housing starts or the ISM. Every single one of those markets that was a bear market rally that turned into a bull market was an economic recovery. And so that's what I'm trying to wrap my head around. It's like, well, that's not at all, A, why we're down, and B, we're not anywhere close to an economic recovery looking at all the leading indicators of those indicators I just mentioned. So I think it's going to be a rude awakening because I think a, a, a classic proper bear market is still largely ahead of us. But that's why I think to the points we were talking about earlier on positioning that people are, um, you know, how can you say people are all bearishly positioned if we just had a huge rally? I mean, the market's the best sentiment indicator of all time, and we get we get a read on it every single day, or at least every work day, you know, for several hours. So, anyway, that's my, my two cents here. Uh, I, I think the bond market got it right, and if you look at their uh, two-year yield, it's you know pretty much back to the highs. The last time the two-year yield was where it is today at three four, S and P P E was about fifteen and change. We opened this morning at about eighteen and change. So I think the bond market nailed it. And the equity market's just catching back up to the bond market. And this hey, rally's hey, over. Hey, can't I ask you one question just because uh, you're, you're, the, you're the fundamental guy in the room. Um, your updated thoughts on the earnings recession that's now started. Uh, how much, and we've talked about it before, you know, re- estimates haven't come off very much yet, but how much have they come down? And where do you think provisionally you think 2022 and more importantly, 2023 earnings could go to? Yeah, I'm more focused at this point. Uh, on next year's earnings, and those got as high as 251, and are now down to 243 and change. So again, they're barely off their highs. And th- that question you just raised again, I think, is is a, is is a, is a problem in this bear market because everybody it seems that they're using the peak in the market and the drop in the market over the first six months of this year as and confused about why the economic data and the earnings specifically and employment to a, to a lesser extent are still pretty good because we're not in an earnings bear market yet. So when you look at the leading indicators of earnings, and that's anything from Fed tightening to the lagged effects of food and energy inflation to senior bank lending, standard tightening standards, um, you name it, everything is pointing to weaker and weaker earnings for at least the next 12, uh, four quarters. And that's consistent with weaker and weaker. Other than that, yeah. Uh, yeah, and Kent, I wanted to ask you, because you were in the, it was great space history. You were in the room uh, mixing up with, uh, with with Lakshman from ECRI. Um, seems like you and I, you and he are, and I just want to elaborate this point for everyone else in the room, your view and his view that there's nothing in sight really to think that things are going to get better anytime soon. I mean, you've been talking about how, looking at PMIs, perhaps they're going low 40s, high 30s, not until 
bottom out perhaps what until the third quarter of next year or something like that did you did your point of view change at all by dint of the space yesterday you're pretty much in that place no no zero no, nothing he said was i think anything new to me um yeah i think obviously there's a lot of overlap in in our work yep um and, that, and that's why i asked him the question i said you know is there anything you see that actually points the other direction because you know not, it's not all often that literally every forward leading indicator that leads earnings and PMI and the NHB and all these macro leading indicators by 15, 18 months are all telling you the exact same thing. And they are today. And I can't remember a time in history where that's been the case. You know, even in 07 and 08, the Fed was cutting in late 07. So you, some people could have been like, wow, the Fed's cutting rates in late 07, yet oil was going straight up. So you had mixed signals. Today, I don't think you have any mixed signals. Yeah, oil's come down, but again, why has it come down? Should come there you down. go. There you Initially. go. That's terrific, Cantor. Please stay up there. I want to keep this thing moving. It's the most unbelievable room. That's fantastic. Thank you for that, Cantro. We go to Michael Belk and KFAB and then Jim Bianca. Hey, Michael, how you doing? What's up? Please unmute yourself, Michael. Okay. Can you hear me there? We got you, Michael. Go for it. Okay. Okay, great. Hey, uh, pleasure to be here. I'm really enjoying the comments. Um, let me uh, start out with uh, referring to some of, of uh, what the recent – speakers just said. Um, first of all, S&P earnings. This is from Standard & Poor's, okay? S&P operating earnings. Q4, 56.73. Q4 last year. Q1, 49.36. Q2, 47.25. To put that in perspective, the Q2 is down, with almost all of everybody reported, it's down 4% Q over Q. It's down 17% year to date. And it's down 9% year over year. So um, the standard and poor's numbers do not agree. Fact set, they're on vacation along with a lot of people, I guess. But I don't know what fact set's using for numbers. But, you know, I started with standard and poor's, you know, and back in the old days at Solomon Brothers, Bob Solomon was head of the research department. He insisted that we use their numbers. And he said, like, a lot of stuff that goes into um, extraordinary write-offs is really BS. It's like, he says, he was a big, uh, he had, his point was, when ordinary things become extraordinary, you know you're in a recession. So anyways, earnings are already down. They're annualizing way below 200. If you annual, annualize at Q2, so what's that, 180 or something? Um, so earnings are down. Um, I, and then talking about the psychology, um, I think Cantor was talking about this. Uh, I think the market psychology is demented. Okay. Completely demented. So all this focus on, you know, even today focus on what Powell says, it, come on. I mean, the bigger picture is what's happening in the economy, what's happening in earnings. Right. And, um, let me flesh that out a little bit. So as you probably know, I'm positive on bonds. Okay, TLT bond future bottomed June 14th. When's that? Two months ago. It's not up a lot, but it's up 5%. So that's the long end, not two-year. So the Fed, yeah, they're raising interest rates, and it's affecting the short end. That's why the yield curve is in, in, in inversion. Um, but bonds are sensing something completely different than the stock market. So all this focus on the Fed and what the Fed is doing, I mean, let, let's put that in perspective. The Fed last year said, inflation is transitory. Don't worry, it's transitory. The whole time they were creating inflation with QE and ne you know negative real interest rates. Now, and they were dead wrong, right? They said, oh, don't worry, don't worry. You know, like, you know, everything's okay. Now they're freaking out. Oh, inflation's so bad, inflation's so bad. Um, yeah, it is. I mean, but I have my work, uh, as you probably know, I have a forward looking model. Everything I'm looking at is what's going to happen next. Not, I'm not looking at how the chart ended today or, you know, the last, you know, over the last year or two, although for perspective, yes. But anyways, um, you know, the Fed is is way behind the curve. The economy is going in the opposite direction, like earnings are going down. You know, as from the from the index provider, you know they're the ones who calculate these things. And by the way, the, all that BS that FactSet says about um, earnings as beating earnings estimates. If you look at the earnings estimates that were on Standard and Poor's going into this, they kept dropping and dropping and dropping. It's a freaking game that people. That it's just such a ridiculous game. The earnings estimates are way too high, and then the analysts lower them 
to right below where they're so that they can out so you can beat the estimate right what a bunch of bs if you look at it they so that the whole time in the months before the reports earnings come way 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 down you can see it in the standard and poor's they have it they have the forward estimates so anyways it's all a ridiculous game so the big picture is i think the economy is weakening we're going into a recession um earnings are going to decline uh companies are going to start you know, missing estimates more and more. Um, my target for S and P earnings, don't laugh, hundred seven. So right now, the street is something like two thirty five, two thirty seven this year, um, and two, two. I mean, two twenty five, two twenty seven, two thirty something next year. I'm looking for one hundred seven. That's the two hundred month average. Um, the the. By the way, that's where things go in major uh, major declines. So. That's where stock indexes go. That's where earnings go. That's where margin debt goes. All that kind of stuff. So put that in perspective. S and P today is four oh five seven, four thousand and fifty seven. The two hundred month average is right around twenty one hundred. Twenty one hundred down forty eight percent. Nasdaq today. Nasdaq one hundred twenty six oh five twelve six oh five twelve thousand six oh five. Two hundred month average five zero four one down 60% from here. So that's not going to happen, you know, Monday morning or next week or something, you know, that's this 12, 18 month target for the end of this long-term bear market. I think we're in a long-term bear market. Uh, so on, on the week, bonds were up 0.5%, okay? S&P down 4%, NASDAQ down 5%, um, VIX up 23% from 20 to 25. Um, I think the VIX could go to 35 to 40, easy. That's conservative uh, as, this, to, as this decline intensifies. Now, let's just focus in on what's happened this year. I use QQQs. It's the best thing to watch. You know, it's a, kind of the heart of the market. So peaked on, like from January 3rd to March 14th, down 21%. These are the key reversal dates of this year in the market. January 3rd, everything peaked. NASDAQ actually peaked November 19th, but January 3rd was almost the same level. So down 21% March 14th. Then March 14th to March 29th, plus 17%. So first down 21, then plus 17%. Then from March 29th to June 16th, down 27%. So Beginning of the year, down 21, then bounce plus 17, then down 27, then June 16th to August 15th, which was two Mondays ago, so just a little less than two weeks, uh, plus 23%. So down 21, beginning of the year, plus 17, then down 27, then plus 23, and then since August 15th to today, the Qs are down 8%. And I see them breaking down big time from here. OK, and, you know, don't sell them in the hole. God, if there's one thing I've learned, I watch the market open every day and these retail investors. I don't know where it's coming from, Korea or the guys, you know, the Robin Hood guys or whatever. But the market every day, there's this huge buying like the trend, the T-R-I-N goes to like 0.3 or 0.4 or something, which shows that the volume is going a huge amount of volume going into, um, you know, NASDAQ shares. So don't, whatever you do, like don't short them at the open because they always bounce them back in your face. Like that's the game. That's the game the algos play, you know, in the retail investors. If it opens down, bring it back to unchanged or something. So um, you have to be savvy about trading this thing. I think we're in a bear market. I think we're going much lower, uh, you know, in this move, you know, maybe. So if you just think about it, we're going, we're kind of going in 20 to 25% chunks, right? That's where we're going. So down 20 plus 17, down 27 plus 23, down eight. So we could go down maybe another 15% or something just to match the, the zigzag pattern, this lightning bolt pattern of a, of a bear market. And I've missed some of these rallies, I'll admit it. You know, I mean, I, I'm not focused on that. I, I always think, you know, the rallies aren't going to last and they don't, but they've gone a little bit further than I thought. But anyways, this the current decline that we're in, short-term decline, you know, well, intermediate term decline started two weeks ago. We're probably only maybe third of the way, quarter of the way through. Um, and uh, a couple other things I want to flesh out real quick here. Okay, macro stuff. Um, dollar. I My model thinks the dollar is topping. And again, I think this is, if you think about how people are positioned, 
they're long the dollar like you you know the the back to the demented psychology macro traders oh the fed's raising interest rates we've got to buy the dollar right oh the fed's raising interest rates we've got to short bonds they're massively short bond positions still too so i think we're setting up for a huge short squeeze in say like tlt so i would say buy tlt on pullbacks it could go up i think the bear market in bonds is over on the long end clearly in my work Maybe it could go a little bit lower, but we're 5% off the lows. There, there's huge short, you know, I think there'll be an asset allocation by huge investors, some of whom are my clients and listen to me, um, out of stocks into treasury bonds, long end, not two years. You know, that's more, uh, that reflects more what the Fed is, is doing. Gold. Okay, now this was not a bad week for gold. It was, you know, basically unchanged to down 1%. Same thing with GDX, XAU, all those kind of things. Um, I my model is looking for a bottom in gold and gold stocks, which is controversial. Like nobody really looks at this too much. It's I wouldn't say it's my number one position, but I'm looking at the for, forecast. It looks bottomy, and that kind of fits into the macro picture of what you know. The Fed is on the wrong side of things. So and the people and the the people the macro traders that are trading off just simplistic oh the fed is raising interest rates inflation is so bad i got to buy the got to buy be long the dollar got to be short gold i got to be short bonds blah 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 i think all those people are going to get blown out of the water and it will be that liquidation of those positions that will probably create a top in the dollar i think it's gradually making one sort of a zigzag top it's making bottom in gold and uh and bottom in uh bonds two more quick things sectors let me get this up. Okay, on the week, utilities alpha plus one percent. So utilities. Uh, one thing I've been dead wrong on. Let's talk about what I'm wrong on energy. So energy. I think energy is topping, but the market doesn't agree with me so far. But I'm sticking with my guns. It's not my number one position, but um, it had huge outperformance this week. Um, after that, though, it was the defensive stuff, utilities and staples. Um, tech was the worst performing group sector on the week. And consumer discretionary was the second worst, minus 2% alpha for both of those. So that's, of course, big hedge fund holdings, right? Those are the biggest things for their longs, tech and consumer discretionary. Worst performing by a mile. So those were down like 5 6% on the week with the S&P okay. down 4%. Um, uh, okay, now that's pretty much it. Oh, one thing, one last idea. For those sophisticated hedge fund guys out there, one thing you can do here is create a synthetic bull market. Now, this goes back to my Solomon Brothers days. I used to price things. You know, I used to be the volatility guy when they were, when they were you know, they want to price an over-the-counter option on something, basket of stocks or something. They would come to me. Uh, I wasn't the only guy, but I, I, I worked with the desk um, to price the volatility, to price some kind of custom, um, you know, over-the-counter thing. So... Getting back to that idea, one thing I learned from doing that, this was a long time ago, you know, like 30 years ago, or something. Anyways, you can create a synthetic bull market through a long and short uh, pair trade. So basically, you know, I would recommend doing that with, say, long utilities, that's XLU or staples, XLP or a combination, you know, split 50 50, and short tech consumer discretionary and cyclicals things um energy yeah it's not it sure didn't work this week but um if you if you look at that you make a ratio out of those so you have an equal amount dollar amount on each side you're long a basket you know say 100 million or something of of xlu xlp and you're short 100 million of xlk xly and maybe xle split you know split between those so in, if you look at the what is the the characteristics of that is you end up with something that's completely it's independent of what's going on in the market and it's sort of a sleep at night trade you miss some of the volatility yeah you'll get hurt you know in, in some of the swings but the volatility is much lower and it's sort of like two steps forward one step back i, I don't think most people can really handle this like it's it's beyond but I, i've been working with spreads for a long time like i said 30 35 years going back to solomon days so if if there are you know hedge fund guys out there looking for ways to to trade a bear market without extreme pain, 
you know, <laughs> what I'm recommending is probably sounds so outlandish, though, be long utilities and staples. Like, who's long utilities and staples? I, I say that to people and they go, like, they, they laugh, you know, it's like, are you kidding? <laughs> it's like, that's not sexy that, you know, that's not, that's not beta, you know, nobody wants to do that. But that's, however, that's, I, I don't think those are going to go up in absolute terms. So if you're a family office or something, don't go naked long XLU, XLP. But it's a sleep at night trade where you can have a market neutral, long, defensive, short, um, the things that people are going to liquid, liquidate. So that's pretty much it. I think the global, uh, the global picture. Oh, one last thing. Um, the rotation in Europe is insane. Like, what are these people thinking? Like, if you read the headlines, look what's going on. Running out of energy, right? These, it, so Germany is basically one big auto plant, right? You know, I mean, by and large, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. But, uh, you know, big exporter, industrial goods. You know, I follow the sectors and stocks really closely in Europe. And these groups have held up. Like, they're, good, they're, not, they're just closing down. Like, without natural gas, they're not going to be able to run their factories. So they're closing, like, aluminum smelters in Slovakia and things like that. I think that's a foretaste of things to, things to come in Europe. Like, it's just going to shut down. And yet these groups, if you look at them, say autos and parts, industrial goods and services, things like that in Europe, the ratio of those, they've hardly declined yet. Yet, like, they're my top short recommendation in Europe. So if you're looking for shorts... I would I would look very closely at cyclicals in Europe because it's going to be a disaster this winter and it's not reflected the mar you think the market knows all you know knows everything looks ahead uh uh it's not reflected the reality of what's going on in Europe is not at all reflected same thing on the uh on the defensive side in Europe so telecom utilities same thing as here um really depressed um I think we've been in sort of a you know, seventh inning stretch or something here where, uh, you know, people have bought, they've been buying autos and industrials in Europe. I said, what? What? what, what you know, WTF? What What are you thinking? Like, who is, the, whoever is in, investing serious money in European cyclicals, I think they're just deluded. Again, getting back to the demented psychology of what's going on in the market. <laughs> Mike, so, Mike, Mike, I <laughs> You know, that's it for me. It, 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 thanks for that tour de force, Michael. You know, it's interesting. I've had people along the way the last few weeks is, uh, you know, is arc blew through 50 or whatever people trying to give me blowback. And one of the questions I got from people was, is there, are there any bulls that you respect or do you agree with any? And I was like, no, I said, I said, I can't think of a person, a single person I respect who's bullish. I mean, and you know how it is. Listen, life is not linear. Sometimes the market makes you look dumber than you really are. Sometimes really smarter than you really are. And, 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 and the truth always lies somewhere in the middle. It's just, again, look around this room. Just look at this room. And it's just remarkable that everyone from a different vantage point, we're going to get to Jim Bianco and Jim Chanos in a, in a minute or two. We've got to do so many people here. I'm trying to work everyone in. But, you know, I, I take, you look for, for, for trend uniformity or uniformity of the indicators, the people I speak to, the people I look to when I lose my bearings. All you guys, many of you guys are in the room here right now. I mean, smart money's been looking the same way. Forget about what how markets have traded the last few weeks. Just hit the mute button on the Cartoon Network. All right, let's move along here. I want to do KFAB and then Doomberg. And I apologize to keep people waiting. It's just, it's like, I feel like an air traffic controller at JFK. KFAB, Doomberg, and then uh, Jim Bian Jim Chanos, and then Jim Bianco. KFAB, the floor is yours. Thanks, George. I, and I promise uh, Michael Belkin and I did not coordinate because uh, the way he ended his remarks segues directly into what I was uh, intending to talk about. Um, so I actually wrote something this morning, um, you know, uh, the, human species has not evolved to be rational and you know the way michael characterized markets being just out of their minds is actually pretty normal historically um and, and what i wrote this morning was you know it's, it's basically sometimes hitler invades poland right and if you go back and look at how markets traded after hitler invaded poland it went up there was a there was a relief rally in september of 1939 it had gone down in the anticipation of the invasion. Oh, and then it, oh yeah, why, why KFAB? Because the invasion was, was not as bad as expected. It was, it was exactly, <laughs> and and shorts were covering. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Sure, Garbaz's work has uh, 
<laughs> the short way exposed in in September of 39. So, um, you know, and then the market traded in a range until May of of 40 when Hitler invaded France. Right. And what I also talked about was small caps in 2008 were only down about 12 percent in the weekly close of September 15th, 2008, the week before the TARP uh, failed vote. And then, you know, that the, the real debacle, the acceleration. Right. So the idea that markets and, and I, I talked about it in your space in at late June and early July about how the markets had rallied through Fannie and Freddie uh, collapsing and, and going in insolvent in the summer of 08. So the fact that markets have been acting in a completely crazy way is normal. Um, you know, it, it's not unusual for history to be unfolding and the vast majority of people not even comprehending and getting their head around what's happening. And I'm sure Doomberg will get into it. But what is unfolding in Europe right now is an absolute catastrophe in the making. Right. Uh, we're, we're eight months out from another guy invading somewhere. Uh, just happens to be a similar timeline. Um, and. I mean, uh, it, it, go back to listen to what Lakshman said yesterday, and Cantor has been talking about it too, as you said. The longest leading indicator that ECRI has is their global industrial cycle. It's a diffusion index that is basically lock limit down on zero because it can't go any lower. And it has uh, basically a time horizon of one year, right? So it looks out a year. That's the longest leading index they have. They have no signs that anything's turning up. And we haven't had any credit event yet. We haven't had any of the major problems that come with the economic reality of the first synchronized global recession in 40 years. Right. Kay so this is the reality of what we're dealing with. Kay the fact that Kay people Kay are completely out of their minds is normal. But that doesn't mean that you need to get swept up in the delusion. And that's what I've been doing for eight months on here is trying to get people grounded in what's actually happening and that it's normal that people get caught up in the delusion and K don't want to face what's K actually happening. K-Fab, I got to hand it to you because usually when I hear Michael speak, I'm like, <laughs> I want to slip my wrist. But actually, Michael Belk, I think K-Fab may have had done you on this one. But hold on. Wait, there's more. Bat on deck, we got Doomberg. And in the no, we got Doomberg now coming up to the plate. Bianco on deck and Chanos in the hole. Doomberg, George, top KFAB. <laughs> I uh, look, I want to build on what uh, KFAB and what um, Michael Belk just said. I put a couple of tweets in the in the nest up here. You know, when you have bloodbaths like today, Dow down a thousand points and everything on the board is red. I'm always curious to see what's actually green. And um, a stock we've been following, we have no position, is CF Industries, which is a fertilizer maker with a giant fertilizer plant in the US. And if you look at the five day chart that I posted up in the nest here, up 15% on the week, uh, totally bucking the bloodbath. Why is that? Um, they are back integrated to US natural gas at nine bucks and change per million BTU. And Europe's energy market has basically imploded. Um, Dutch TTF natural gas closed today at 90 bucks. Uh, Asian LNG, 70 bucks. Um, and then the other, tweet that I put in the nest is just literally an unbelievable chart it is the year forward electricity prices in Germany. It's a broken market. Um, the chart is actually meaningless as a great thread by uh, Mike Green put out earlier this week um, at 980 or a thousand euros per megawatt hour. Um, we are watching the steamrolling of European manufacturing. Um, and so who's winning on, in the bloodbath today? It's American based manufacturers who are back integrated into a comparative, it, it's literally an unprecedented energy spread, uh, but get to price their product on the global market. Um, ammonia and um, various fertilizers are, are globally traded commodities, basically solid forms of natural gas. And you see a company like CF Industries up 50% on the week at the same time that the European uh, manufacturing sector is getting decimated by the complete bubbling of the energy policy in Europe. And then now you have Jerome Powell this morning, um, as hawkish as he can be, um, and you still have, um, you know, a Lagarde in the, in the ECB um, pondering whether they should perhaps increase rates above zero. So how, if you're a, um, if you're a manufacturer based in Europe and um, you have basically a devastating disadvantage compared to all other manufacturers in the world, especially the US-based ones, and then on top of that, 
um, U.S. dollar wrecking ball is rolling down the hill. Um, I don't know that anybody has in their models the level of damage that the complete collapse of the European energy sector will foretail. Um, and there will be winners and losers. Um, it's not necessarily um, a, a broad brush to say that um, the collapse of European manufacturing is, bullet, is bearish for everybody, um, but it's certainly bearish for European-based manufacturers, and, and there's some winners as well. So there's you know, an opportunity to pick a few stocks in here, and that's all I wanted to add to the conversation. Thanks for having me up, Joe. Doomberg, always, always welcome your insights. I, I just got to say, this is some, someone just DM'd me, and I just tweeted it out. I quote, this might be the single best space Twitter has ever had. Unbelievable insight in the midst of what will be a historic period in the market. Not to shill, because we're not doing this for any money. We're just trying to help each other. But just look around you. I mean, to, to go to a conference, have any one of these speakers speak, it would be one thing. To have this amount of, 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 of gray matter in one place at one time, and we're all sharing, trying to help each other, it's just truly extraordinary. It's to, thanks to Twitter, and thanks to all of you for making this so special. So enough with that commercial message. We now go to the Jim part of the program. Jim Bianco, and we've got Jim Chanos on deck and Nancy Davis in the hole. Mr. Bianco, what's up, my friend? How are you doing, George? And yes, this is a great space. I'll keep my comments uh, focused and I'll keep them short, kind of like the chairman's uh, speech today. Uh, and I think that that's really, I want to riff off of what Michael Belkin said. I think everything you said, Michael, was right. And the result is going to be the Fed's going to keep hiking and hiking and hiking. Chairman Powell spoke for eight minutes and 28 seconds today. He mentioned the word inflation 47 times. He mentioned the word recession. He didn't mention the word recession. That's a scary thought that I actually know those statistics about his uh, speech today. Uh, and he had one message. They are not going to pivot. They are going to raise rates. Now, we can argue how much they're going to raise rates whether it's going to be 50 or 75 at this meeting, how much there's going to be up to in the next meeting. And throughout 2023, they are not cutting rates. If we continue to see the stock market do what it's like it's done this week, that's not dissuading them. He already warned you that if the employment or if the labor market falls apart, that is not going to dissuade them. He has already said that there is going to be pain. That is not going to dissuade them. This market has been driven by liquidity and cheap money, and everybody wants liquidity and cheap money back. And July 28th, when he spoke at his press conference, July 27th, excuse me, when he spoke at his press conference, he said we were roughly close to neutral and that the Fed was going to go off forward guidance. And everybody took that to mean they're going to pivot in 23 and really put afterburners on the rally. He put a halt to that today. So the question that I think we need to answer is, if Michael Belkin's right, we go to $107 on earnings, and the economy goes in the recession. Actually, I think it already is in recession, but it goes in the recession. What is the Fed going to do? The Fed, I think, is going to look at the inflation numbers and hike rates. And then you're going to say, yeah, but, but it's all ugly, and they're going to hike rates again. And then you're going to say, but it's gotten worse. And then they say, okay, fine, we're not going to cut them for a year. That is the reality that I think there came across today that slapped everybody in the face and that we have to recognize that for all of the bearish arguments we heard, and I am with you on those arguments, the answer is not going to be cheap money is coming. And that is what the reality of, this, of these markets have been this year with the record decline in the bond market, with the worst six months for, to start the years in 50 years. And now the big turnaround that we've seen in the last couple of weeks after a 50% retracement, uh, which is, to me, a, a textbook bear market rally. I know there was some talk earlier about whether or not it was the start of a new bull market, but I think it was a bear market rally. And I just think that if the hope is the Fed will blink, the Fed will cave, the cheap money is coming. I, he gave an eight-minute soliloquy today that none of that is going to happen. And now you have to start valuing companies based on all that stuff we don't want to pay attention to. Whether management's got a good product that people want to buy at a reasonable price and they've got margins that they can continue to move forward with. No, that's boring. We want to talk about QE and money printing and leverage and what our hedge fund friends are doing with their 13B filings. And that's what we want to see to push the markets higher. That game is over if you're hoping that the Fed is going to be the basis of that game. 
I think they're serious about what they're saying about with inflation. And until otherwise, I think we have to take them serious. And I think that that's what the market recognized today. I said I'd keep my comments short and sweet. I'll end them there. Thank you. Hey, Jim, spot on. More power to you. I guess we're in this sort of Midwestern uh, part of the program. We went from uh, Wisconsin to Illinois. I think we got another Badger coming in here. I think he's in Florida now. But anyway, my good friend Jim Chanos, how are you? What's going on, my, friend, my man? Hey, George. Hey, everybody. I, I was just looking for a happy hour. Are you offering two to one on well drinks? <laughs> Um, well, since I'm, I'm probably one of the few people that remembers the Blitzkrieg rally in, uh, in September of 1939, um, you know, and, and, uh, it, it really struck me, Michael Belkin's comments struck me, it was one of, what I wanted to opine on, um, was the quality of the earnings that we're seeing in 2022. Um, and I did not know that S&P is already showing uh, decline in quote unquote operating earnings. Um, just in my little world of garbage and, and radioactivity and, and, and fraud. Um, what, one of the things that we saw in the second quarter building on the first quarter is increased use of pro forma metrics. And, and those of you that follow me on Twitter know, you know, my, my, my bugabear is, is share based comp. Um, it's not only is it getting even greater than it was in 2021 as a percent of adjusted earnings, but now we're beginning to see the very insidious flip side uh, of what uh, some of us have been warning about for a few years as, as Silicon Valley has just doled out um, untold billions in share-based comp. They're beginning to have to buy it back. And uh, you saw that with uh, Salesforce.com. Uh, the other night, announcing uh, with great magnanimity, uh, magnanimity um, a $10 billion buyback. Well, uh, it was greeted with a thud for all the right reasons, the same way that DoorDash announcing its buyback, because these companies are now telling you with a straight face, many of the leading lights of the market, a lot of benchmark stocks, that, that you have to add back this share-based comp to get to the adjusted earnings. Because remember, Salesforce doesn't really make much money. Um, and a lot of these other companies, uh, like like DoorDash and uh, Square, I'm sorry, Block, whatever, lose money, um, but report profits. Um, the uh, that they've got to start buying back stock to avoid massive share count increase. But you should add back the share based comp, but disregard the multi billion dollar share buybacks we've now encountered on to offset dilution. This is going to continue, and. It's interesting to me in that that when you talked about the rallies, uh, I don't know if it was Michael or, or or John or someone else talked about the rallies in 2002, which I remember vividly. Um, we saw a stair step drop in Nasdaq bellwethers back then, drop bomb after bomb starting in the fall of 2000. Um, this year, it's being masked a lot by these pro forma adjustments. And it's why I keep harping on on my feed. Um, it's really stunning to see a, a lot of it. And, of course, you know, financial journalists and Fin TV, um, you know, routinely just parrot what management says about what they're earning. The reality is, is that they're earning a lot less than what they're telling you. And I think that's going to get worse. I think the, the attempt to uh, to hide it can only go so far because of the fact that, that the – use of share-based comp and rising share prices is a virtuous circle. It is now the virtuous cycle. It's now turned into a vicious circle, i.e. lower stock prices pisses off all the people who got share grants up 50%. You have to issue more stock to them to keep them. And in many cases, in a lot of these companies now, the, the, the mid-level and senior people are getting half of their total comp in the form of equity. And um, I just want to point out that, that keep your eye on this because uh, it, it seems to be getting worse. I think uh, it'll probably, to mask what is probably going to happen in the second half, uh, it'll get even worse. Uh, it'll even get uh, even crazier for some of the bellwethers. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Enjoy the weekend, everybody. Hey, hey Jim, as long as I got you, if you could yeah. just uh, extend the defense a little bit, um, let's go to next level thinking. Mm -hmm. um, let's sort of spitball here a little bit. Um, so thinking about the sociology of ownership of a lot of these things, 
I mean, a lot of companies that came public should never been public at crazy valuations, yep. cash flow negative, need external financing. Yep. A lot of very high profile, well known uh, Manhattan based uh, public uh, you know, hedge funds, Chase, Coleman, et cetera, not to pick on anybody. But I mean, you just think about this, and all that seems to me all the exit doors are now closed. And not that what happens to Tiger is going to matter per se, but using that as a proxy. For the investor class more generally, all the uh, all, all the pension funds and all the other crap. I mean, it just seems to me that this has the potential, if not likelihood, to really have some serious, serious uh, ramifications here. Not necessarily for the banking system, but I, I just think we're closing the door on this whole era of free money for everybody and game over. And it really represents a true, a true departure in, into a different investment regime. And, and we've seen a generational top on all this madness. Any, any part of that you want to weigh in on? Weigh in on? Well, well, first of all, I mean, you, you mentioned Tiger. So I, I, I want to just comment on, on the passing of, of, of a friend, Julian Robertson, who, who spawned the Tiger Cubs, both for good and bad, but um, was a legend in, uh, in the business and someone uh, who was a friend and a client, and it was really sad to hear that news um, this earlier this week. But uh, look, we have we have you've heard me say it before. We've had the, the this market was the dot com era on steroids, and so many of these business models that that got floated and and traded at hundred billion dollar valuations. Um, you know, still in many cases trade at, at, at 30 to $70 billion valuations, just simply made no sense. Um, they've made no sense all along. You know, if you're in, in the fintech space and you're in effect a subprime lender, you saw what happened to a firm today, and you're not making money in the past two years with 0% interest rates, stimulus checks, you know, going out for, for two years, um, and, and, and massive, massive venture capital money thrown your way, if you couldn't make money then in that part of the cycle, when are you ever going to make money? And, and we can go right down the road to Web3, um, which is, you know, one of the, 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 the most massive sets of frauds I've ever seen um, through, uh, you know, more basic crypto scams to, uh, again, I mean, just businesses – that, that really aren't very profitable and haven't been profitable for 10 or 15 years that traded amazing valuations because they keep growing their top line. Um, and so I don't know how that all shakes out. I don't think it's a banking problem, but on the other hand, um, it's certainly a very, very large part of our economy. And it's part of our economy that has captured the attention of, as you say, a certain number of money managers who, are loaded to the gills with privates as well as this stuff. Um, there's been no hedge fund closures, as one of the previous speakers has said. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're kind of in the early innings of this unwind. I don't know what that does with the S&P. I don't, you know, I don't try to predict that. But I do know in that world, there's an awful lot of silliness uh, that just has not even been remotely wrung out in terms of how you value businesses, what you would value these things, and whether or not the business models are viable. Thanks, Jim. Spot on. Please hang around. I'm sure there'll be some questions. Let's go to Nancy Davis, and we have Wall Street Silver on deck. Nancy, good to hear from me. What's up? Hey, George. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me up. It's great to be here with you all today. I was um, definitely shocked that it was only eight minutes uh, this morning. It was a little... Uh, uh, anticlimactic, and I have an out of consensus idea for for those of you. I'm calling bullshit on Pal. I don't believe it. I I really think in September we're going to see a 50 basis point hike, not 75. It's, I haven't heard anybody else say that yet. I think it's it's a head fake. I just don't buy it. I don't think he's that silly because he's going to be tanking the economy. I mean, obviously the markets agree, but I think we're going to be 50 in September, not 75. What do you all think? Uh, I, I'm next and I agree. So I'm going <laughs> to. I have to tell you a year, a little over a year ago, one of our clients came to me and said, Nancy, I think the U S is going to become the new Japan. I think we're going to have massive deflation. 
I think, you know, this is the end of the era. The growth is going to be slowing. It's going to be uh, negative or lower long-term growth. Um, interest rates are, long-term rates are going to go to zero, if not negative. This is the end. And they're like, will you list a fund for me? And I was like, well, I don't, I don't really see that happening. We're not Japan. We're different. This is the United States. Like, we're not going to do that. Anyway, long story short, one thing that was green today was that client's idea. BNDD, our deflation ETF, was had a huge day today. And I'm kind of sitting here thinking like, oh, my gosh, maybe they're on to something. I mean, if, if Pal does this, I think that's where we're going to be. It's just uh, it's just insane. Well, um, what if he does 100, Nancy? What if he does 100? Just general. Not saying he's going to. Just curious, to get your thoughts. I mean, I, after listening to that speech today, I, my my first thought was he might want to shock the market. Yeah, yeah. To well, 122 and a half is priced in through the end of 22. If you look at Fed fund futures, so it's kind of more a question of timing. But I, I don't know. I just I thought it was so intentional and so scripted. I mean, eight minutes, you know, not talking about anything else, only talking about. I'm calling bullshit. That's what I. Yeah, and, 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 and Nancy, let me just interrupt here. I want to. I want to work in. Uh, actually, you know what? Before I open my mouth, I want. Let's let Jim Bianco respond to that because he's got a good call on those things as anybody. And then I want to respond. Jim, do you want to respond to Nancy? Yeah, I mean, first of all, off the top, you you you're not wrong. This is an unprecedented period with no historical reference, right? So the Fed could be completely full of shit and could completely turn around and go the other way. As I said in my comments, I'm going to take him at his word. It was eight minutes. It was, we are not going to pivot, mic drop, walk off the stage. And I'm going to take him at that right there. Um, I think, if anything, the, I'm on the idea that the Fed's going to go a lot more aggressive. Now, why do I think the Fed's going to go a lot more aggressive? They, they being the Fed, has made the case that inflation impacts 100% of the population. Every single person gets impacted by inflation. They don't give a shit if every person on this call gets blown up. So what? Move on, and they're going to go on, and they're just not worried about the stock market having a bad year or, or even if the labor market turns down. Now, if it turns out to be 08, then they might blink. But then if it turns out to be 08, that's the end of inflation anyway. So that's the way that I look at it. I think they're going to be aggressive. They are fighting for their reputation and survival in terms of inflation and that we have to take them to be serious. But you're again, I'll say we've never been down this road before and there is no historical precedent. So if they wind up caving and printing money next year, sure. I mean, you can't trust them. We're not sure where they're going to go. So those are just kind of some of the thoughts that I had about. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. sir. So that's thanks for that. Chat. That's great. I'm going to use this to let Michael Guyad weigh in, but I'm going to channel my inner Michael Guyad. I'm going to set this up before he speaks, and that is Michael. Are you going to, cur are you going to curse a lot? If you're going to curse a lot, you're going to channel your inner Michael Guyad. Yeah, no, uh, but that you've been cursing lately. I don't, I haven't been. Um, but Michael always says it's one of his catchy uh, lines, and I don't know if he made it or he borrowed from somebody else that path matters more than prediction. So, in other words, you could both wind up being right. So, Michael, with that, um, I yield, yield the floor to yourself. No, and, and that's actually that's a good segue because I want to actually ask Mr. Uh, Belkin. Uh, Mike, good to good to see you. I don't know if you remember, maybe a decade ago, you and I had drinks uh, at So House uh, when we were part of the Belkin Report, which on a side note, I do encourage everybody to go take a look at. Um, selfishly also because Michael Belkin's analysis often tends to line up with mine, although in a different way. So a couple of things. First, I shared in the nest, and some of you probably have seen this. Those that have, I'm going to keep hammering this point. Uh, and Jim alluded to this idea that we, there is no historical precedent. What we see this year really is unprecedented. It's not a hyperbolic word. When you look at the interaction of treasuries to equities in the equity drawdown, we never saw anything like we, what we saw the first six months of the year. Full stop, not my opinion. You go back to 1961, you look at the top 50 biggest drawdowns for the S&P, you have never had in an extreme drawdown for the S&P an extreme drawdown in treasuries, spike in yield. Okay, so that is really actually quite important because that means your classic diversifier for equity volatility ended up just looking like equities. That's also been my own hell as somebody running these risk on risk off funds, my mutual fund, my two ETFs, they all use different signals and they all have the same problem this year, which is that they all use treasuries in that first six month, which caused a very nasty 
drawdown across the board. Today, by the way, is more classic risk off behavior. If you haven't noticed, TLT, long duration treasuries making money, yields dropping as stocks are down hard. That's the flight to safety uh, trade. That's the risk off trade. And by the way, that term risk off does not mean no risk. The reason why treasuries act as a risk off play is because it's default risk off. There is a link between equity volatility and credit spreads widening. That's why you see that money go into treasuries. Now, I know, Michael Belkin, you've been talking about treasuries. I've been on it as well. So I want to throw this to you, and I want to make this a broader question about what could cause or force the Fed to actually reliquify, uh, which is uh, the dollar. And the reason I bring that up, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, Michael Belkin, I don't know if this relates to your treasury thesis, uh, and if that treasury thesis means we go back to that historical inverse correlation in high volatility of treasury equities, but... It seems to me that if the dollar were to keep doing what it's doing, uh, you've got a sovereign debt crisis imminent. And I mean, like very, very soon. And if you really want to get rid of dollars and if you really want to evaporate liquidity, uh, default is one way to do it. So, Mike, I want to throw it to you. Um, had you factor in the dollar in some of the intermarket ratio analysis that you look at? And does the dollar's movement concern you? Because that could be a tail event that could throw all these talk about hiking rates out the window. Hi, Michael. Yeah, I do remember uh, Soho House. Yeah, uh, hello again. Um, yeah, to me, the dollar and yields. Uh, I mean, it's, it's one big trade for the speculators. I think it's pregnant with speculation. Again, I, I think it gets back to demented psychology that the macro traders who have actually been doing pretty good this year, but I think they're, they've overloaded the boat at a major um, inflection point. I do not expect the dollar to keep rising. And um, to answer your question, I do think bonds and, and uh, the S&P, uh, long bonds, not short bonds, so TLT, SPY, I do think they're becoming negatively correlated. Uh, again, they haven't been, as you said, and I was short bonds, you know, for 18 months or something, but I think the bond bear market is over. I actually like to hear what Jim Bianco has to say about that. He's more of a bond guy than I am, but, um, I like bonds. I think, um, I think it's setting up for a major asset allocation shift. And I, I've said this before on here. I witnessed this in the 87 crash in, on the Solomon brothers trading floor where, a, uh, the GM pension fund, a couple other pension funds just panicked. They sold out all their stocks leading up to the crash. And if you remember what happened is the stocks went down, the bonds were going down, gone down, down, down. The bonds stabilized. The stocks started crashing and then the bonds went apeshit crazy, like went up 20 points right away. So I, th I don't know if it's going to be exactly like that. Never, nothing's ever exactly like anything else. But I, th I sense we're setting up for a major asset allocation shift. And if you want to know that's terrible for the stock market, right? So if these big asset allocators, pension funds that control trillions and trillions of dollars, if they pull the plug on the equity market, I mean, forget, you know, retail investors, they're like small fry, they're minnows. It's like the reef. It's, a, it's the sharks eating the, um, everything else on the reef. You know, when the big asset allocation, allocators say enough's enough, 3%, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna lock this in instead of losing 20 percent of my stocks. I, that that I saw that firsthand in the 87 crash. That's what did it. Stocks crashed and bonds went up 20 points. So that's all. That's what. Let, let, that's what let, let, me, let me do a quick follow up on that because because uh, I think it's interesting and, and I want to relate this again to something I know you watch carefully, Mike, and I do too, which is utilities as the bond like proxy. So utilities have obviously been a much better risk off defensive. Uh, trade than treasuries, which is abnormal because usually in big drawdowns, while utilities outperform, they don't outperform anywhere near the extent of treasuries except a year like this year. Um, when you see the utilities outperformance, which is consistent with a risk off, um, does that make you think that treasuries will have a resync? Because part of this risk on risk off dynamic equity treasury dynamic is also about treasury outperformance correlating to utility outperformance as the treasury proxy within the bond market uh, within the stock market rather um yeah good point i i wish uh unfortunately i have a weak connection i could sit in front of my computer and run utilities i i do every all these ratios like you do i've seen your stuff um f from time to time when it gets on twitter or something um so um uh, yeah utilities divided by the s p that's something i watch really closely relative performance of the utility sector which i said i know i commented before 
that was one of the top performing sectors this week. Not that you made money, it just fell less than the, uh, than the, than the index, but it had 1% alpha this week along with staples. So yeah, I think um, staples and utilities and bonds are the defensive, that's the thing that people run to when they get scared. And there has been no fear in the equity market since, you know, again, the dates were June 16th to August 15th. So there was two months there where we had a 23% rally in the, in the NASDAQ. And the other speakers have gone on and on about that, about how people went, um, they covered their shorts. It was a big short squeeze. They've gone back and lock, got long tech and everything again. Um, so that I, I think, you know, what we've seen in, the last, in this week and a little bit last week, it's the beginning of fear. And I do think that will benefit utilities in relative terms, not absolute. Again, absolute. if you're into absolute returns, there's not much look, looking great. Maybe um, bonds, TLT, it's about the only thing that looks um, like it has upward potential in a crash. Thanks, Michael. Thanks both, Michaels. Let's keep this moving. This has just been the most incredible room. And just when you thought we'd heard it all, we're now going to hear from my good friend, Dr. Anas Haji, who is going to speak a couple minutes on the energy market. Uh, he needs little introduction. He's been in these widely recognized leading speaker on the oil markets. He's been in our spaces. Always learn a lot from him. Uh, we had a space uh, in us a few months ago, but you've been in a lot of other spaces. So maybe just from where you, you sit, uh, the corner of the world that you specialize in, maybe give us the energy perspective. The floor is yours. Uh, yes, uh, since we are going to have a, a space that is dedicated to energy within a couple of days, uh, I'm going to keep the best stuff for later. Uh, but for today, uh, and it's related to the events today, what do the Saudis want? The fact is, oil is a political commodity. So whenever we see statements or actions from OPEC, OPEC members, OPEC plus, etc., it's always about economics and politics. So when the Saudis three days ago in that interview with Bloomberg, uh, they made the statement that they are willing to cut. Uh, by now, we have nine countries uh, within OPEC Plus that supported the Saudi call to cut uh, production. Uh, so what was that about? Uh, the Saudis, in terms of economics, they want to maximize the uh, real value of every exported barrel of oil. And how can they do that? They do it by, of course, higher prices and higher dollar. So there were several messages in that uh, interview with Bloomberg. The first message is literally to the U.S. Fed that do not believe the Biden administration. Oil prices are not going down and therefore inflation is going to stay and therefore behave based on that. Why? Because they get a higher dollar from that. That's number one. The second message to the Biden administration itself that you guys are going to have that uh, nuclear deal with Iran and Iran is going to increase its production, and you think you are going to uh, l literally give up something to convince Iran to uh, uh, agree to the deal, and therefore you want them to increase production, guess what? We are going to counter that by cutting production. So that's another message to the Biden administration. But there is a bigger message. The bigger message is the president of China is visiting Saudi Arabia very soon. And they are going to repeat the same thing they've done with Biden in terms of oil. Uh, when Biden visited Saudi Arabia, they isolated oil from the visit. For, from the beginning, they said, keep oil aside. We are not going to discuss it. That's it. They are doing the same thing with China. Why? Because the, uh, the Chinese have already told them they would like to see oil prices in the 60s. And the Saudis are telling them, no way. And please do not even talk about it. So when the president of China comes to Saudi Arabia, don't even discuss uh, oil there. Then the other message is to, the, uh, to India and China. Look, oil prices are going to stay really high and get that discounted Russian oil. We are going to shift our oil to Europe and buy the Russian oil. So that's a coordination within OPEC plus itself. And then there is another message to uh, OPEC plus members that, this agreement that's supposed to end at the end of this year, it's not over. We are going to renew it again. So we have all those messages. So in terms of timing, it's perfect timing. In terms of messaging, perfect messaging. Was the statements accurate or not? There were contradictions in them or not? That's a different story. But the fact is, 
the timing of them and the messaging was just unbelievable. And that's all. Back to you. Thank you, Anas. And, you know, when you think about it, you've got, you know, think about the impulse at the margin here, the old triple demerit scenario, you know, the idea of, of, of higher, not lower oil prices, higher, not lower interest rates, higher, not lower dollar. I mean, all ambig- unambiguously negative for risk assets. I mean, like what else could possibly go wrong, as they say? Uh, with we, that- we, we, uh, we will discuss this uh, <laughs> in our next energy yes. stuff because we will talk about the impact of the drought. Yeah, we have- <laughs> And, and, and us, we should have Doomberg uh, join the space. Maybe yeah. we could get we, maybe we could get Doomberg and you to do it together or something can, like that. And can I ask Doctor Anas a quick here. question while we have him? Because it's yeah, yeah, go for it, Doomberg. Go for it. Go for it. I, I, when I read the comments of uh, of the Saudis, and I concur completely with your analysis, I wonder if I couldn't ask you one more dimension. I, I couldn't help but notice they were commenting on the uh, the disparity between the paper and the physical market and. They use the word, uh, you know, the volatility in, uh, of the paper market. Felt to me like they were calling bullshit on the paper price of oil, and and perhaps implying that there was some uh, intervention on the part of uh, of uh, the U.S. government in the uh, decline in the paper price of oil that we've seen from the highs. Uh, did you read the same thing, or am I uh, out in left field here in, in overinterpreting what the Saudis said? Um, I will I will communicate with you privately on this. Okay, you bet. Thanks. Thanks. Doomberg, Doomberg, I think you have your answer. Okay. Uh, let's keep keep it moving here. This is fantastic. Uh, we're going to go to Guy Sorondulo and then Gilberto. Hey, Guy, how are you, my friend? What's up? I'm doing great, George. How are you? Um, yeah, sorry I couldn't be on earlier. I just had things going on, but I have freed up some time. And uh, I thought what I could contribute to the discussion is maybe start off with the same word I used last few times I was on when you asked me to come on and it's a, just a, another big disaster waiting to happen. Um, you know, I, I don't, I usually wait to, you know, tweet charts out um, after I might send something out to clients, but I did post uh, a couple of charts on my Twitter space. One, which I sent earlier today to, to people, which shows the S and P confirmed another inflection point on my money flow unit work, which is starting the next leg lower. Um, and then also the the weekly, you know, more of an intermediate term time frame of where I'm seeing thing. But for this discussion, I just want to also, you know, th- think about and talk about, you know, technology and NDX. Um, there's about another 39% downside in, from the work that I do on where this index could go. So it's great to come on the Twitter spaces. And I think, you know, what you're doing is a, is a help to a lot of people. And if I could only contribute a few little things, it's just preservation of capital. And, and, you know, you and I worked in a big shop years back and then Wellington later for me too. And, you know, we help man- managers that are, that are managing more money than here we have on our head. So they're basically moving battleships in a Harbor. So I, I have not participated in this rally off the, the July low. Uh, for me, it was all within the context of a bear market rally so my point to people were to you know add to energy on the way on the way down. I still think we have higher to go there. My work is looking at 127, which is something I published many months back, and I still think that's doable. Uh, other than that, some of the fertilizer names, which were mentioned earlier, I like too. But basically, it's this is a shit show, and you know, just some in, in a simple way of looking at things. Uh, yeah, I do agree looking at the slope and, and where the 40-week moving average is on a lot of these indices, whether it be the NDX, the S&P, et cetera. And then I, I do a lot of work with looking at regression trend channels off the highs. And this recent rally in a lot of these indices all coincided last week and kissing those those sweet spots. And this is just another start of, of a move lower, and it's um, it's going to be pretty ugly. So, yeah, Guy, let me ask you one question. Um and this is, I'm going to ask Guy and also Michael Belkin if you're still there. I mean, let's focus on energy just for one second. And also, um, Anas, so there's been a big divergence between the price of crude and the energy stocks. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Guy, you've been correctly bullish on energy uh, the whole year, the, the entire year. Michael Belkin made a brilliant call in mid-June, calling crude down. I think it's down 25 30% from there. Mm-hmm. Initially... Uh, the the equity call was great as well. They fell out of bed. Now they cycled back up to a new high. Anas, you were correctly cautioning people uh, a couple of months ago about the possibility of the economic slowdown. 
you know, reducing in a slight reduction in demand, what that could do to the oil price. And so let's take these in turn. I'll go with you first, Guy, and then you, Michael Belkin, and you and us. So, Guy, when you look at the divergence between the stocks and the commodity, um, you know, a lot of interpretations that one can make on that, and maybe that's best reserved for an us. But mm-hmm. when you look at when you look at the just the charts, you know, trade what you see, not what you think. And you look at the, at the crude chart, and you look at the at the commodity uh, chart. I mean, usually you don't get these disconnects; they don't last for too long. You think it's more likely they're gonna it's gonna the gap's gonna close by crude going up or the stock's going down? First guy, and then Michael. Uh, definitely crude going up. I mean. The way I, if you just in simplistic ways, you just look, you could eyeball the chart of, of oil um, and you could easily, from the, the way I look at things, the momentum has definitely waned from the peak we had in June. And if anything, to me, we're starting to carve out a low. I mean, your 50 day is going to start coming, coming into your 200 day just to look at, you know, averages of some sort. But I think within, within days or next, you know, few weeks, we're, we should have, Crude popping through ninety eight and maybe a hundred too. For me, it looks like crude is crude is carving out a low. I think we are going to inflect higher, and and it's just going to be playing catch up to the stocks. I think it was you know our, my old boss Bob Hill that mentioned it years back when I started Fidelity. When you when you have stocks that are tied to a commodity, whether it be like a gold or or here with energy, the stocks tend to lead the commodity, and you know maybe that's the case that's that we're seeing here now. Uh, the stocks are ahead of the uh, are ahead of the air of, of the of the commodity, but I think it's also, you know, people are trying to play, you know, areas where they could get a, a bit a bit more exposure to a group that's you know not a big weight in an index because it's still pretty small within the context of the S and P. So maybe fundamentally, people are starting to gravitate to some of these these names, and they're you know they're not willing to sell. The, you know, the thing is, if you if you look at some of these stocks, they're they're not. They're not getting big impulsive moves down. There's, you know, Petrobras or, you know, there's a bunch of them in front of me now that, you know, they're down pennies on the day or even some are up. So there's not a lot of selling coming into the space from the way I, I read the charts. It just, to me, dips are being bought, you know, early morning weakness is being bought. And if, sure. if these if these things were not going to, I think the strong hands coming into it. That's the way to think about yeah, it. Yeah, no, I, this I, is I, this is not a work day or a Met or a Lulu or that people want to crap out. They were, you know, they were renting a lawn, so to speak. Sure, sure. No, that, that's helpful, Michael. You got any thoughts on that, Michael Belkin? Yeah, um, I just did a quick and dirty look. Uh, so everything, my opinions come out of the model forecast, and I, I'm still bearish on energy and energy stocks. <clears throat> I think. What we're having is a bear market bounce. I think they peaked, you know, months ago. Um, and the only caveat here is it's so weird what's going on in Europe, you know, where there's, they're gonna, there's not enough gas, right? So it, that, that's the wild card. However, the weakening economy globally, that's going to pull the rug out from under demand. So, um, you know, like, you know, um, what OPEC does, and what Iran does, those are all wild cards. But I, I, I suspect that we, uh, we hit a major peak in commodity and energy prices about four months ago. And um, this is a bear market bounce, just like we had in the NASDAQ. That's the way I look at it. And so I would not be long. I mean, for a trade, yeah, it's working. It's not working for me because I'm short them and I, I, I still remain short them. But um, I think they're overowned, and if you go back to 2008, what happened? Energy, the crude oil price went up and peaked towards the middle of the year, and then it went down more than 50 percent when everything collapsed. And um, nothing's ever exactly like anything else. And there are some caveats here, obviously, because of what's going on in Europe, and of course China. Now they're saying China's coming back. I don't really see it. The, the stimulus is not enough. It's not really changing the trajectory of all the <clears throat> property companies and everything that's, that's going bust. So I think we're in a, a commodities bear market. Things have bounced the last few weeks. Base metals to ag a little bit. They're still all shorts to me. That's great. And and us, maybe you don't want to give away the secret because we're going to have the room in a few days. But you want to comment anything at all on energy? You'd rather just hold your fire. Well, up we are uh, literally in uncharted territory right now. So I think uh, predicting oil prices in the next couple of months is going to be uh, uh, really risky in various ways. And the reason why 
because of this drought. That drought is changing everything and killing demand on one side, killing supply on the other. So the outcome or the net is unknown. That's it. 100%. And and I'll say it, I'm not going to put you on the spot on us, but my own conspiracy theory view, which was implied, I think, by Doomsworth's question, you know, uh, and one of the reasons I actually, I thought Michael's call was really great back in June, um, you know, the idea that that the they's, the Biden administration, do everything they possibly can to get their price of oil down. There are often methods that the average person can't see, but whether it's, uh, you know, dumping, uh, draining the SPR to 40 year lows, or uh, the, you know, the not so hidden hand of, of, of getting involved in the paper markets, if by hook or by crook, given the political imperative of getting the oil price down, it's something they would endeavor to do. So, it, you know, I, I could totally get they're going to try and paint the tape and make it look as good as possible for the election. What happens after that's anybody's guess. Uh, have, you see, have you seen the letter from, the, uh, from Jennifer Granholm, the energy secretary to the refiners today? Uh, Spec- poop, poop, poop. Amazing, yeah. Yeah, so, so Anas, why don't you, Anas, Anas and, and Doomberg, Anas, you want to weigh in on it? Doomberg, do you want to have a shot at either of you? I mean, what was, do, Doomberg, Anas, do you want to tell us or, or Doomberg? Anas well, the, better, yeah. the Secretary of Energy sent a letter. Uh, it is, has kind of like uh, a threatening tone to the refiners that they have to sell their products within the United States instead of exporting them and asking them to raise inventories in the United States. And uh, there are many issues with that letter. Uh, one of them is, uh, of course, this is a free country after all, and we, have, uh, we don't have any restrictions on exporting oil or products. Uh, the second point is um, th- we are sending those products to Europe uh, to help Europe so Putin will not break the, Europe, the, the European Union. Uh, so from politics, it might work for the Department of Energy, but for the, uh, uh, for the Secretary of State or for the Department of State, it may not work at all. The other issue is any legislations, because now this is kind of like we are asking for your cooperation. Uh, but if they really, by a presidential mandate, prohibit or lower the exports of gasoline and diesel, we are going to end up with a crisis in the United States because we are going to end up with no gasoline and higher prices, which is the opposite of what they want. Back to you. Doomberg, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I I agree completely. I'm trying to put it in the nest here because I retweeted it earlier with the comment that um, when you're led by clowns, expect a circus. Uh, It's it's really, it's, it's, it's really a remarkable letter and something we predicted many months ago that um, as we got closer to the election, that the, um, the impulse uh, of protectionism would be irresistible. Um, and the um, ability for this administration to think in second and third order effects and the unintended consequences of their action um, just doesn't exist. And look, uh, Jennifer Granholm, um, God bless her, um, uh, we would put her in the same category as John Kerry, uh, noted scientist, you know, um, no clue what she's talking about, um, laughing at the prospect uh, uh, of perhaps there might be some reticence uh, among the U.S. oil and gas producers to invest billions of dollars to bail them out politically, while she's simultaneously in the same interview saying her intent is to put them out of business in five years. Um, these people are clowns. That letter was a joke. Um, it, the, the, the Biden administration should be... Um, and, you know, holding hands with the uh, American uh, energy uh, CEOs and leadership um, uh, for the good of the country. Instead, it's just cheap political points. Um, that's the type of letter that adds three, four, five bucks to uh, WTI, assuming there isn't a, a thumb on the scale uh, uh, with a printer behind it. Um, and it, it's just really a joke. It, it's flabbergasting that uh, Jennifer Granholm is the best the U.S. can produce lead the a position as important as, as the Department of Energy, mm-hmm. for her to write a clown letter like that uh, is, is actually truly disturbing. Wow, mind-boggling. It is the clown show. Uh, before, we go to my, uh, before we go to my good friend, uh, Gilberto, I, uh, if, you, if you raise your hand and want to ask a question and I don't know you, please send me a direct message. Um, I want to keep the questions on point. So send me a direct message if you want to be recognized as a speaker. Uh, Gilberto, good to see you. What's up? Haven't heard from you for a while. Good to see you, George. Yes, in fact, a long time I don't participate in one of your spaces. 
I've been listening to the distinguished guest of this space, and I would like to offer a view about the dollar situation in emerging markets and how central banks are having uh, issue with the refinancing of the sovereign debt because of the increment in the Fed policy rate. And it's, what I want to say is as the second half of this year reaches the point where most of the governments are submitting their respective budgets to the legislative houses of each country, there's a pressure in the respective ministries of finance to issue new debt because they have to, of course, supplement the expense of governments. Uh, most of the emerging market governments are deficitary governments and they are dollar denominated uh, in debit. So what's happening? Next two years are very important because most of governments are going to go into elections as same as the United States. And the cyclicality of the government election spheres dictates that it will be the, it will be an increase in the social expenditure. So they need more money as they are getting closer to elections for for obvious purposes. So what's that that put a pressure in the bonds uh, debt than they are offering to the market. And what's I think is going to happen and how this is an actionable trade is that they will overextend as the Fed increments the rates in the next uh, meetings, two, three meetings. And after that, it's, they gonna, uh, as, as they overextend, that can be a good opportunity of entry. And as the budget is expanded into the first, first half of next year, it will recover some of the losing ground and then, of course, we'll have much more clear picture. So this, in this way of thinking, dollar is going to go, going to stay high, uh, at least mostly in a relative uh, perspective, uh, given EM currencies. And there's also an a interesting situation that is given up in the countries who raised rates much early like Chile and Dominican Republic and Brazil, and is that they're going to revert to the mean. And this, that is also an interesting trait to have in sight. That's all. So, so Gilberto, are you suggesting that there, because I know you're, I think, in the Dominican Republic, and you're talking maybe particularly from the perspective of South, okay. South America, are you suggesting that we're going to have a, a, a debt problem that some of these some of these uh, Latin American bond markets are really going to fall out of bed. Is that where you're going? Is that what's behind your your, your question or suggestion? I think they're going to press their uh, issuance bond issuance to finance a much greater government expenses program as the cyclicality of government elections approach in the two prox the proximal years. So I don't think they necessarily going to default. I just think they're going right. to offer a really good deals. Got it, got it, got it. Hey, Jim Bianca, are you still listening in? Jim? All right. um, that, that's an interesting point, because um, I was thinking of the fact that you now see in some other countries. Hey, hey Jim, uh, I was curious. Uh, so Gilberto was speaking about the possibility of increased spending in some of the Latin American countries. And I'm curious, because I know you're paying attention to this, the uh, offering of subsidies to defray higher energy costs. I know Doomberg has spoken about this in the European context, but you see it in Europe, you see it in the U.S. Um, who knows, there's also going to be goodies handed out for the student loans or whatever. But specifically, um, do you see increased spending here being used to by governments in a lot of places to uh, help fund the increased energy burden, Jim? Yeah, well, I think it should be used for that. Um, whether or not it is, is a different issue. The other problem you got to keep in mind with the energy problem, and, and Doomberg could probably talk about this too. The energy problem started Monday at a very bad place, and Friday it's 25% worse. Uh, and who knows how much worse it will get next week and next month and into the winter before it eventually goes there. But as far as um, the subsidies go, um, 
the, the, there is talk uh, in a lot of the, the countries about trying to subsidize the poor to pay for high, some of this higher energy, but where they're going to get the money from and how that's going to come down remains to be seen. So it's about the best I can do on that topic if anybody else wants to jump in. So as we, we, we've been saying for months um, yep. um, repetitively that the resolution of the European energy crisis heading into the winter of 2022 and 2023 is the single greatest geopolitical and macroeconomic event of the year. Um, and it, it's amazing to watch this relatively slow moving train wreck in progress. I just had a DM exchange with somebody who's saying uh, a big um, a big trend that is being missed right now is this outflow of the top 1% out of Europe to the U.S. East Coast, um, kind of like how we saw everybody move from New York to Florida after COVID. Um, anybody with means is getting out. They see this train wreck coming. Um, it is really remarkable. You know, those those tweets we put in the in the nest here, look, we come from industry. Um, we spent decades in the commodity sector. We have a deep visceral understanding of what it means when natural gas is trading for $90 per million BTU in Europe, when it was trading for two bucks in the U.S. 18 months ago. BSF, fertilizer companies, aluminum smelters, zinc smelters, auto manufacturers, the entire German economy can function at these prices. And we're looking at these prices. And nobody is yet, at least in the markets, as far as we can tell, connecting the dots between these companies can't operate at these prices. And these are the prices I'm seeing on the screen. And so to the comment earlier about why is, you know, CF industry is bright green on a bloodbath Friday like we saw today there's going to be people that win and then whole swaths of the economy that lose. And, and it's a staggering chart, like France and Germany for, you know, year forward electricity prices kissing a thousand euros per megawatt hour. This was 40 euros 18 months ago. You can't have a, a, a 25 fold increase in a commodity that parks right at the very front end of every supply chain. And expect that your manufacturing sector is going to um, do anything but go into a deep, deep depression. And it's this is far greater than the financial crisis of 08, in our view. Um, and it feels like, you know, the screaming like the guys were at the big short. Like, this is happening. Look at your screens. Connect the dots. And it, it it's really staggering um, to us. Hey, do my Kimber, can Kimber, I throw a question at you? Um, what sure. About, what about Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan? Where are the, how are they going to shake this out? I mean, it's they, one thing to say it's bad in Europe because, but they've got some money. They can pay up for some of this stuff. But what about those countries? Oh, the crashed, crashed. I mean, again, what is, we, we feel like we've been too early on this, and which is why we don't trade because, you know, timing is everything in trading. Um, energy is life. Um, and what is the price elasticity of demand for life and who can afford to pay it? So your point is precisely correct. We're seeing huge unrest in Pakistan today. Why? They can't get, you know, any response to their RFPs on, on the incremental charge of, uh, of LNG. Nobody's selling it to them. Why? Because the Germans and the Western Europeans are desperately filling their tanks as fast as they can. And there's been some, you know, macroeconomics types on Twitter saying, look, the storage levels in Germany are good. Everything is fine. They, they should stick to the euro dollar. But um, the, the, the storage in Europe is only one part of the equation. There's the flows that they need as well. Um, if you're in December in Europe, you are simultaneously bringing in new molecules of natural gas and pulling up from your inventory. If the flow of new molecules coming in is where it is today, no amount of storage is going to save. Um, and so this is Putin's card. We gave it to him and he's playing. Um, it, it, it's to your question, um, the clearing price is being set by the wealthy which means that the exportation of inflation is staggering and you're going to see um, starvation. You're going to see unrest. And here's a real thing that, that few people are calculating into their models. In the past 20 years, the West, because of nimbyism, has exported all of the ugly parts of the true running of the economy, the mining of copper, the mining of you know, zinc, uh, the processing of such materials. Uh, this is dirty stuff, magnesium, um, and so on. Uh, we've exported that to the parts of the world that have looser environmental standards. And then we pat ourselves on the back and saying that, you know, somehow because it's cleaner around me, we're doing good for the planet. Um, all of those countries that have the incremental <laughs> production capacity for the absolutely critical front end of the supply chain starting materials are going to be the biggest victims 
of the European flubbing of their energy policy. So when you see food rights in Peru and you see um, revolutionary governments being elected in the Perus and, and the political unrest in Chile um, and Indonesia, which is a major coal exporter and a major cooking oil exporter, um, and Pakistan, which is a nuclear power, by the way, um, this is a very dangerous game we're playing. Um, we, we, we think that because the storage units, the storage levels in Germany are okay versus historical averages when you're comparing historical averages that had much higher flows uh, than Putin is putting on offer today. And somehow we think this is going to be great and everybody's hyperbolic. Um, you know, look, it's called Doomberg. Um, we're not here for the, the rosy outlook, but also I happen to think we're right. Um, what's going on in Europe is a catastrophe, is a black swan, um, and the ripple effect of the giant stones that are being thrown into that that lake are going to hit the shore. Um, and so that to us, this is the biggest story that while it's being covered, I don't think it's being fully internalized. Thanks for that, Doomer. That's fantastic. KFAB, uh, you want to jump in? Yeah, just, just real quick, um, relative to uh, Michael Belkin's um, comments and, and where his model's at on the dollar. And I, I presume that's largely Dixie folks at focus or dollar index. Um, and, and, and also Gilberto's um, uh, mentioning on the emerging markets. Obviously, the emerging markets are, are idiosyncratic, uh, as you well know, George, uh, with your long history with them. And I mean, if you look at, and, and, and again, kind of buttressing with Doomberg's comments, as crazy as some of the politics have gotten to be in Latin America, which again, that's all relative. It's always kind of crazy down there. My wife's Peruvian, so I can say that, um, is uh, with the far left coming in with Chile and Peru and Colombia, those currencies have actually made kind of failing rally tops with the US dollar and are starting to strengthen. Because, you know, they're mostly quoted in dollar uh, other currencies. So I, I think what we might be seeing again, relative to what Doomberg and, and this catastrophe in Europe, and some one of the things I've written about is if you look at the Euro Swiss franc cross as a key proxy for what's going on in Europe, and the Swiss have basically decided, okay, sayonara, we're, we're letting it go. Uh, the experiment of trying to peg to this, I, I think, you know, they've kind of let that go. So, um, you know, to talk about the dollar, quote unquote, in what's going on right now, I think it's far more nuanced. You got to look at crosses. You got to look at what's actually going on in specific pairs because uh, it's getting quite noisy now with how complex this backdrop is getting. And if you're just just looking at the Dixie, which is you know hugely euro and pound sterling, um, w which is in the epicenter of this catastrophe unfolding. Um, I think you can kind of miss the signal from the noise. I would I would just add for context, uh, Dixie is 83% euro, uh, pound sterling, and Japanese yen, and all three regions are deeply short energy today. One of them is being sane, um, which is Japan, which has uh, decided that it's going to restart nine nuclear reactors um, as quickly as it can do it. Um, the other two are still in deep delusion that somehow there's still this great empirical power that can just dictate to the world uh, and somehow convert um, platitudes into physics. Um, and so there's not yet enough pain to be suffered in Europe before they get serious about things. But DXY as a measure of U.S. dollar strength is, is highly, highly, highly tilted towards three geographies that are deeply short energy. And so it is, I think, uh, incomplete to measure the U.S. dollar strength with that narrow of a lens, although uh, it is certainly a big part of the U.S. trade volume. And so I understand why. Yeah, and, and the fiscal the fiscal situations of some of these countries, this is why the idiosyncratic part of the emerging markets, I mean, people think about the the banana republics, quote unquote, of the 80s and 90s, the legacies in Peru and Chile and Colombia, their fiscal situations are completely different. So yes, they've got these kind of far left people in charge now, for now, who see how long that lasts, um, but their debt to GDP, all these things, it, it's it's not anywhere near what it has been in the past. They've actually, on a relative basis, been run fairly conservative from a fiscal perspective. Great insights. I have, Jim Bianca, if you're still there, I have one question for you before we go to Carpathia. Uh, yes. Jim, I, could we, one thing we haven't talked about much here, but I assume it's game on. Can you just review for the room? You, and, and, and by the way, I, I, I'm remiss. You should give everyone on this who's been speaking here a follow. I mean... Jim is fantastic as is Anas, Tom Thornton, Duberg, Nancy, Michael Belk, and Kiva, everybody. They're all just incredible. And Jim, your conference calls like phenomenal. Can you just review for the benefit of the audience um, 
the pace of QT, like, you know, the balance sheet hasn't shrunk very much yet. I understand it's because of some trade settlements on past securities are purchased. Also, the tips thing, yada, 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 you covered all that. But along with everything else you got to worry about, about, you know, no cuts for you in 23 and we're going to raise rates. Can you just review um, where we are with respect to QT and we, have we yet to see the full effect of it, Jim? Yeah, so just so everybody knows, the Fed has decided that they're going to reduce their balance sheet, quantitative tightening, by when they're fully ramped up, $95 billion a month. That's $60 billion a month of treasuries and, um, that they're going to reduce it by, and $35 billion a month of, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, mortgages. They started it June 1st at half that, $47.5 billion, and they're ramping up. September 1st, they'll be fully at $95 billion. Now, what does that mean? They have a $9 trillion balance sheet. They have most months, they have more than $95 billion of securities maturing. They'll just buy back less, $60 billion of treasuries, $35 billion of mortgages. In the first few months, as they were doing this, the problem with mortgages is they get revalued all the time. They're not a static face value security and that their prices were rising as they were cutting them back. So people were going, where's the balance sheet reduction? It was all in mortgage revaluations. But leaving that aside, they can go, once they get to 95 billion next week, they can go about two years of just doing roll off. So they don't have to sell anything because they've got $300 billion worth of treasury bills. So in those months that they don't have 95 billion of securities maturing, They'll just run down the treasury bill. So they could take this to about the middle of 2024 before they have to make a decision. Um, the Fed has made it clear that this is what they're going to do, and they're going to do no more or no less. For the moment, they're, they're, there's no noise there about they're going to reduce QT or maybe go to $120 billion a month. I think it's because they're afraid of it. They know they have to do it. They remember 2018. It didn't end well for them. So they're kind of in their mind getting away that they've said, why right, we're going to do 95 billion. We've announced it. We've started it. We started it at half speed. We're kind of tapering into it to use that phrase all well and good. If we want to change policy in any way, we'll cut, we'll hike rates by 75. We'll hike rates by 50 <clears throat> or we'll stop hiking rates, but they're going to leave the balance sheet where it is. Now I've said all of that just as a backdrop of what they're doing. There is a bit of a concern like, it was mentioned by Michael Guyot and others. Look, there's so many things here that we have no historical reference for. So we're kind of guessing. We don't really have a historical reference for the Fed reducing their balance sheet. They tried it once in 2018. The markets blew up and the Fed did the Powell pivot two weeks later where Powell came out and said, we're going to be flexible, which was his way of saying, I'm sorry, we're not going to, we're not going to be uh, as aggressive on reducing the balance sheet. So, we don't know what this is ultimately going to mean for the banking system or for liquidity in markets. But yeah, we've got a lot of smart people with spreadsheets that are guessing, and we got to hope that one of them are guessing right. And the last thing I'll say on this is there's also the reverse repo facility. That's the, um, the facility for, for money market funds. That is where a, a money market mutual fund uh, can, pay, can park their money with the New York Fed and get you know, a competitive interest rate that has $2.1 trillion in it as well. That is another form of QT. So in the coming weeks, if the Fed raises rates again in September and you start seeing money market funds approaching 250 to 3% on your, um, on their yields. And you look over at a traditional bank account, a demand deposit checking account, and you're still getting 20 or 30 or 40 basis points which is the case, you could start seeing money say, I want to get out of my bank account and get into a money market fund and just log on to the JP Morgan Chase website and there'll be a dialogue box that pops up and says, why are you getting 30 basis points in the bank account when you can move to the JP Morgan money fund and you can get 2.6%. As that money moves, that is another form of taking deposits or taking reserves out of the banking system and putting it into a non-bank asset, a money market fund, it can have a very similar effect to QT as well. So there's so QT is a drain on ass, on reserves, excuse me. So is reverse repo. We got two drains going at the same time. 
We've got no historical precedent in what this is going to be. We've got a bunch of PhDs at the Fed that have measured this and said we're good and got it wrong in 2019 and then measured it after they adjusted in 2019 and said, okay, now we're good. Then we had the repo crisis in September of 19. And for the third time, they're saying, okay, we're good on this right now. And we're all holding our breath to see whether or not that's the case. So we're like, just to, just to repeat what you said, I heard you're right. We're in a place you've never been before and nobody really knows. I mean, so good luck. Is that what I heard you correctly? Yes. And the big difference is we're in a place where we've never been before draining reserves. Ten years ago, we were in a place we've never been before printing reserves. Well, you know, that was one that was leading to exuberant markets and no one complained about it. This one is going to be about draining reserves. We're not sure how that was, was one is going to totally play out. And the first couple of times that we've tried it, uh, the Fed stubbed their toes in 2018 and 2019 on it. Got it. George, that, can, I, can I say something real quick relative yeah. to what Jim just said? Go um, for it. Go for it. Yeah. So L Lacey Hunt's Q2 uh, letter that he did for Hoisington uh, got into the difference between M2 and other deposit liabilities, which I think is kind of what Jim was touching upon um, to a degree, and and how that feeds into velocity of money and how it basically makes the monetary policy asymmetric, meaning that this is separate from you know the impact on financial markets when when they eventually do pause and then go back to whatever it is they'll do eventually. Who knows when that will be? Um, but the fact that with, with what's going on with the deposit base, the banks are, you know, um, really in a tightening cycle here. And that uh, this is going to be very asymmetric, meaning that even when they do flip the impact of monetary policy on the economy because of these transmission mechanisms is going to be very, very weak. Got it. Well, so KF, KF, you're, you're saying the impact will be weak or the economy will be weak. I'm sorry. The, the impact of them reversing when they do reverse, when they finally go back to, you know, let's say they go back to 2% because we're in a global recession and it's slapping everyone upside the head. Everyone realizes what the damage is being done. When they do finally flip and start cutting again because of what's going on with the deposit base and the monetary aggregates, that the, the, the monetary specifically is going to be asymmetric, meaning that's not going to be effectual. And that's that's why I think what's going to happen is they're going to go guns barreling. This is, you know, second, third, fourth order thinking as you play out to the response as this cycle plays out is going to be they're going to go berserk on the fiscal side. Well, let me let me ask this question both for KFAB and, and Jim Bianco. Let me just play devil's advocate. How, KFAB and then Jim. KFAB, how would you respond to the assertion that, you know what, all this QE stuff, it didn't really do much for the economy. It just gave us a big asset bubble. And it gives bull market and financial assets, risk assets. Okay, fine. And therefore, um, and you can argue what the secondary effect of that is in the economy and, you know, the wealth effect and all that nonsense, 2%, 3%, whatever it is. Okay. But all this talk about, oh, you know, it's going to blow up the economy, blah, blah, blah. It never really did that much for economic growth. It just gave us a bull market. And therefore, conversely, like we may have a bear market. We are having a bear market because of all the reasons Doomberg and everyone else and Michael Belk and everyone's talking about. I got that. But the idea that QE, QT is really going to, you know, have a deleterious, serious deleterious impact on the economy. No. How, how would you respond to that, KFAB? And then Jim. I, I generally agree. It's, it's, it's largely a financial market um, impact rather than the, the quote unquote real economy or main street. But what I think did happen in the pandemic, which opened Pandora's box is the wedding of fiscal with monetary. And that that's the potential regime change as we play out this cycle, meaning that as things get as bad as, you know, some of us suspect it will in the next 12 months, 12 to 18 months, the, the response to that, I think, is going to be relative to that Pandora's box being open because of what you're pointing to, George, is that the, 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 the main street economy is going to be so bad and the monetary regime is going to be so ineffectual that they're going to go back to all that they have left, which is fiscal. And because of the amount of debt that we have, the likelihood is that they're going to have some kind of breakdown of the independence of the Fed, like we saw in 2020. And that that's where you get out of this, you know, debt trap regime and you start introducing, 
you know, more of a open ended longer term inflation problem um, because you're just sending people checks and you get supply and demand curve shifting. And eventually the real risk is Gresham's law. Got it. Hey, Jim Bianca, you there? KFAB uh, teed it up for you nicely. Yeah, I, I would. Uh, I'm just going to re- reiterate some of the things he said because I agree. It's the same way I would have answered the question. It's not QT is not going to affect your local dry cleaner, or your restaurant, or uh, they're not going to notice it. It's really a financial market phenomenon, and if it winds up real riling financial markets enough, then your dry cleaner and your restaurant tour they may notice that as a second order effect, but not as a primary effect. And I completely agree <clears throat> that what happened with QT, QE in 2020 was when we went really over the top. Remember, remember, we had like a $4 trillion deficit because we were pumping money like crazy, either through PPP or through other government spending to try and keep the economy afloat. And the Fed was there buying hundreds of billions of dollars in some cases a day in March of 2020, but then wound up buying trillions of dollars worth of securities to allow the fe- uh, to allow the federal government to issue bonds almost on an unlimited basis at a very cheap rate. Fed was there to buy them to help suppress interest rates so they can hand out that money to everybody. San Francisco Fed did a study and they found that of all the developed countries in the world, during the pandemic, only one developed country saw personal income, personal income being your W-2 plus all your investments and whatever government transfers you get, went up. Only one country went up. It was the United States because we printed and sent out more. We printed, borrowed, and mailed out more money than anybody else that the country became wealthier when we were all locked down than any other developed country. Everybody else went backwards. And I think that that impact is what really changed attitudes. And we saw a big surge of spending, a big change in attitudes, and we saw inflation. So if QT comes along and the Fed is not there and the economy turns down and the federal government says, okay, time to deficit spend to get the economy going again, and the Fed throws their hands up and says, no, nope, we can't buy bonds this time because we've got a 5 or 6% inflation rate. There's an old adage in the bond market. There are no bad bonds. There's only bad prices. The government don't get their bonds sold, but they may not like the price that they're going to sell them at, which means much, much higher interest rates. So that's what I'd add to it. Thanks for that, Jim. All right, a couple more, and then we're going to call it a day. We're going to do Carpathia and Chad. Carpathia, what's up, my friend? Hey, man, great day. I decided to fish instead of leave the chat, but I'm glad I did. Hey, Carpathia, we can't hear you. Can you speak up, please? We can't hear you. Is that better? Oh, you got to yearly yell loudly. But I could hardly, I can barely hear you. Is that better? Yeah, it's still a little soft, but it's, it's try. Go for it. Can you hear me? Yeah, but it's very soft. Do you have a headset on? Hey, Carpathia, can I ask you to leave and come back? Uh, I'll have Chad speak. Um, we, we can hardly hear you. Chad, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks, George. And uh, just a, a couple of quick points. And I have a question on QE. Uh, I'm going to direct towards Jim and anyone else who wants to jump in on it. Well, first of all, for anyone who's not an institutional investor in this room, I mean, I've had I've worked for companies that have paid $10,000 just for a seat to send me somewhere for a day uh, to listen to the people with the kind of lineup that we have in this room today. And then I'm also a client of Jim Bianco's. Um, you know, not to disrespect anyone else in the room. I just may not have followed you as long, but uh, Jim has just been, you know, dead nuts on for on a lot of things, you know, for over a year now. So, thanks to Jim for that. And then my question is um, related to QE. So we have, do, can we? Is there a possible scenario with the decline in prepayment rates that we've seen? Um, on the MBS side, you know, coupled with timing and a given maturity month for treasuries that for the Fed to hit its monthly target, that we could actually see them uh, selling MBS in the market. That's my question. Uh, yes. I mean, I want to divide that question into two parts. Um, the $60 billion a month of QT that they're going to do on the treasury side, that's a pretty straightforward calculation. It could run off a spreadsheet and they should be able to to hit that one without it being too difficult. You're right though on the mortgage side, the 35 billion that they wanna reduce the mortgages by every month, 
and the pre the change in the prepaid speeds, the change in the in the housing market. Look at the way that the housing market has changed. If you watch any of the Redfin numbers, that you know the average home was selling for above list price through May, and then we've seen like a record number of markdowns on homes. Then the pace of selling has dramatically changed in the last sixty or ninety days with the big rise of interest rates. And what I'm leading up to is. I don't know anybody can model this stuff. I think at the best of times when you've got it all figured out, it's very difficult to model prepayment speeds. But in this environment, you're just guessing with prepayment speeds. So there could be a instance where the Fed might have to sell MBS in order to meet the 35 billion. Now, the question is, will they do it? I would offer a guess is the answer would be no. What they'll do is they'll come out and say, look, we hit the 60 billion for treasuries and that's what's important. And the mortgage thing is because mortgages are more difficult and we're having a little bit of a more difficult time with mortgages. But you understand mortgages are harder. We're hitting the 60 billion reductions in treasuries and they'll try and split the baby that way. So, yeah, I do think that there might come a point where they'd have to sell in, on the mortgage side to meet the mortgage uh, targets. But would they if it came to that? Um, they're so afraid of QT right now. They don't want to be pushing the envelope on anything. So that's my best idea there. I'll just stick one on the back of that, Ron, that, Jen, if I can, is uh, it, if you get in that situation where they're under meeting uh, reduction on the MBS side and they say, you know, we're not doing that for now because we don't put more pressure in the market. Is that in and of itself going to put more pressure or take more pressure off the market, do you think? Would they find themselves in a scenario where they have to you know, if, announce that they've had to you know, miss that target just to avoid – the putting pressure on the market per se, no, I don't think it would because, you know, if they miss their target by now, remember, they're not going to miss their target by 50 billion. They're going to miss their target by three, five, seven billion dollars or something like that. So if they miss it by three or five billion dollars, is that going to impact a multi trillion dollar market? No. But will it give people reason to pause and a credibility hit to a Fed that's already under fire for they can't get anything right anyway? And this is just another thing that they messed up. And another reason, like what Nancy said, to call bullshit on this Fed and that they're going to do a complete bow face on everything that they've said before. Sure. It'll even make me start to wonder, like I said, I think they're committed to the inflation fight. But then, you know, I'll even start to think, you know, some Monday is Jay going to wake up and say, forget it all. I'm sorry. We're going to start printing and try and get everybody a job again uh, in the hell with inflation. So on a credibility standpoint and a Fed that really is fighting to keep their credibility, it could be a big problem. I shared a, um, a tweet in the nest. It's an old tweet. It's from July, but the link is still good because not today, but yesterday the Fed bought mortgages. And so I think it's really important to keep in mind that even with these caps increasing in September, as the mortgages and treasuries mature, the Fed still needs to buy to keep the level of the balance sheet, uh, at their level. So it's um, the cap was initially 30 billion per month for three months for treasuries and then uh, 17 and a half billion for mortgages. But yesterday they bought mortgages. Literally, I put the link in the nest. George, can I jump in here? Go for it. Um, hopefully you can hear me now. I think it's important. Yep. Um, Go for it. The, you know, this is the A team. You know, we're talking, this is like the, the most incredible information, Nancy, everybody. I, I'm not going to name everybody, but how many people we got on here? A thousand. And I want to talk to them. What you're hearing is the highest quality of information. And I know for a fact from my consulting business, not everybody can grasp it. But here, here's a message that I want to send to everybody. Um the only way through a valley, uh, the only way to cross a valley is through it. You heard Michael Belkin, you heard KFAV. I'm going to miss somebody. We've never been here before. We think this is happening. But here's what I want to the people out there that are saying, wow, this is the John O'Connor from the Terminator movies. I want you to just t grasp this. The only way through this, the only way across is through it. So you're going to have to decide, you know as I have, my family office has, my little group in Fort Worth have. And I know you don't, most people don't get it because this is high level stuff we're talking about, but let's break it down. The great moderation is over. 
The deglobalization is over. The energy crisis that Doomberg says is here. So you're going to have to decide. And the financial services industry maybe has you in a systematic passive. But you can do two things. You can look at some of these ideas that we're talking about. I kind of agree with Nancy, but we have to get through it three months. Or you can play defense because the old regime is over. Take your beer goggles off. The last decade, what worked in the last decade, this is what I can guarantee you. We don't really know the next three months. I got my guesses. It's my money, my office. You're going to have to decide how you're going to get through this. I, I have my ideas, defense, but if you don't understand this stuff, seek somebody out. This is some high level stuff and it's fantastic, but just don't listen to the bullshit they're going to throw at you about, Oh, just stick to the model, whatever. And that's all I got to say back to everybody. Thank you. Thanks Carpathia. All right, let's go to uh, Neely. Hey Neely, what's up? Hey George. Would love to ask the panel if someone feels passionately about this. Um, I've been stacking up a whole series of questions that are haunting my curiosity uh, heading into the back half. And the one that's been really occupying my brain is um, I went back and thought through all the times I was wrong, which was many. Um, and one of them was when I believed Ben Stein in the uh, September of 2007 article. I just posted it, I'll put it in the nest again, where he was like, everybody needs to take a deep breath and basically diminished, you know, kind of the impact of the subprime loans for the mortgages. And because in our practice, we both do economy and advise economy, like we help small businesses and we advise, you know, publicly traded companies on, on matters of the economy at the same time. I can't get out of my head. We've got 4 million EIDL loans coming due uh, with the first payment due this fall in October, specifically um, for some that we advise. And when you look at it, you know, those EIDL loans went like 90% of them went to, you know, underserved markets, fewer than 10 employees, um, 13% of them kind of, or 4 million would represent about 13% of small businesses broadly in the U.S., and, you know, if you go back to 2007, subprime mortgage loans were like 14%. So I guess my question is, is I, when everybody's talking about really important topics, but they're well-discussed topics, is anybody talking about what happens when these SMBs don't pay off their loans, which amount to $400 billion of disbursement? Curious. Thanks. I think we're going to, Jim Bianco has his hand up, and of all the people on the panel, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but um, I think he's the best place to answer your question. Jim? Yeah, so, no, I think a lot of people are worried about loans, um, like the EIB loans that you were mentioning. But I think that the bigger issue is the moral hazard issue. Oh, don't get too worked up about it, because the government will see that this is happening, and they'll write a check, and they'll make everybody uh, whole on it. Look, we just spent $500 billion reducing um, college loans and, and the like just this week. So if there's going to be another $500 billion loan problem, we're going to try and bail that out. So there's a gigantic moral hazard that's hanging out there in this market. And this is part of the thing that I raised my hand about. And I'll kind of transition into that a little bit is the old regime that, you know, up till 2020, um, I'm going to channel my inner Zoltan Posnar because I got this from him. Uh, there's basically three things led to the previous cycle that we were in of low inflation, low interest rates, low economic volatility, and leverage the hell out of everything in financial markets. The first one was cheap labor. We don't have cheap labor anymore. We got 3.5% unemployment. We got 5% wages. And employees are in the best position they've been in in a generation to demand wage increases. The second thing we had was cheap goods from China. So even though you weren't getting a raise up until 2020, we were offsetting that because things were getting ever cheaper at Walmart and you could continue to buy ever cheaper stuff from China. Well, that's changing. We're talking about reshoring and we've got political strife between the U.S. and China. Heck, they just blockaded Taiwan a couple of weeks ago in a show of force of what they could potentially do in the future. And the third thing, and this is in the Bloomberg's uh, play, uh, wheelhouse, is we had cheap energy from Russia to Europe 
in order to uh, fund or uh, push their manufacturing base that they could make ever cheaper things because it, you cannot understate how important energy is into a manufacturing process. We don't have that anymore either. And so we've lost all of those things. And now we've got all of these bigger problems coming, which is why we've got inflation, which is why when we talked about, you know, going through this process of the bear market, look, the economy's changing for all of those reasons. But in there, there's a residual of the last cycle. If there is a segment of lending or if there is a segment of the market that is in trouble, heck, I might even say to Doomberg why people are not really getting that exercise about what's going on in Europe right now is because they're still thinking of the echo of the previous market. It is still August. It is still 80 degrees. I can't get worked up about freezing this winter. Besides, somebody will figure something out to make this go away because that was always the case up until 2020. But that could always be the case because when you had cheap labor, cheap goods, cheap energy, you never had inflation. And the answer to every problem could be turn on the printing press. But now that you don't have that and you have inflation, the answer can't be turn on the printing press anymore. And that is a difficult thing for people to get their head around. So when you talk about loans being a problem and is anybody paying attention to it, some are, but others are still thinking this is 2020. A lot of people in Europe, I know who Doomberg was talking about, about that macro person on Twitter that was saying, look, Germany is filling up their, their, their storage facilities and it's all going to work out. Um, that's a 2020 men, pre-2020 mentality is what that is. And that always assumes no inflation, no economic volatility, zero interest rates, turn on the printing presses and every problem goes away. That's the hardest thing for people to get on, get their head around is has this, this cycle has turned. This is a different environment than the one before. Jim, I, I, can I, just, I, I gotta say it. I mean, this is why I brought the analogy of the housing crisis in 08. You know, back then it was housing prices never go down. What are you worried about? It's, it's contained to subprime. Oh, it's just a, a German issue here and they will work it out. I, I can't agree more with what you just said. All of the fundamental underlying assumptions of how um, for the past 40 years the, the world has worked are being challenged simultaneously. Um, and, um, and it's really just fascinating to watch. And look, I, it, maybe it won't play out. Um, we happen to believe that uh, German electricity prices are the, uh, you know, uh, the, the Lehman Brothers moment for um, the European economy. And, and it's very difficult for us to model how the rest of the world um, models through with the collapse of, of, of manufacturing uh, in Western Europe. Anyway, back to you, George. Sorry. D Doomberg, Jim Bianca, I can't agree with you more. Thank you so much for, for, for that. I urge everyone in this room to turn off CNBC. And if it's on, hit the mute button when Jim Cramer comes on. These people are hazardous to your net worth. Part of what's so great about this room is we have independent thinkers here who are not trying to sell you anything. They're just speaking the truth. We all get it wrong sometimes. If you're not making mistakes in this business, you're either lying or you're not taking enough risk. But this is the best assemblage of investment intellect I think I've ever seen in my life. So I want to be one of you for this. And with that, I'm going to turn to Gnostic to have the last question and the last word. Gnostic? Oh, I don't know. I'm the good one to have the last word in there. Can you hear me okay? We got you. We got you. Okay. Uh, Doomberg and Jim, thank you both. Those were the best presentations I have heard on things in a long time. Doomberg, in particular, I sent you a note. Uh, thank you for your summary on natural gas. Wow. Uh, I really wish I could put three or four books into a summary like that, just like you did. For the question here that I have, <clears throat> which relates back to Jim and to Neely, um, the infection of moral hazard uh, has been going on for some time and seems to have infected almost all governments everywhere and even at the retail level on an ongoing basis. And moral hazard appears to be the, it, the essence of the conversation we've been having here seems to be the moral hazard of being rescued in all of this. But the counterside of moral hazard is, as Doomberg was saying, the, <clears throat> the wars, the fights, the, the starvation, all of the rest that seems to be going on that people seem to simply be ignoring in other parts of the world. Uh, when do we, if we do, get past the issue of moral hazard to be able to sit down and deal with the pain that that moral hazard cr has created over the last 20 years and get past this and do
do we do that? And if not, how do we protect ourselves in a financial sense from the consequences of that moral hazard, which is a financial disaster that I see coming uh, that Carpathian was basically saying, you know, duck, because here comes the, the, you know, destruction ball swinging at us. So the question is moral hazard successfully overcome or not? I'll, I'll take a stab at it and Duberg, if you want to jump in after me, um, moral hazard is, I think, as I said before, it's it's an echo of the previous cycle, because in the previous cycle, we had a unique set of circumstances that we could bail everybody out and that we could offer a bailout of everybody. And we hit, you know, the peak of moral hazard. I, I tend to think that the peak of moral hazard occurred in April of 2020 when Wall Street was openly saying that it was time to buy high yield debt because you were co-investing with the Fed. Now, how could I ever be, how could it ever go bad? Because either the company's going to be okay and pay me back or Jay's going to print the money and pay me back. So either way I get paid back. That cycle is over is, is I've tried to argue, unless you want to make the case that all of these things, whether it's cheap labor, uh, cheap goods or cheap energy is going to come back in the next couple of years. That is very hard for people to get their head around because, you know, we've been taught on Wall Street that be careful of the words. This time is different because it almost never is, except when it actually is. And then it's a big deal. And that's really the question is, is this time different? And I would argue if the way the markets have traded in the last in the last several months, what's happening in the energy markets, what's happening in the commodity markets it already is different. It's not even a prediction anymore. It's a statement of, of history that it's different. So we're going to continue to believe in moral hazard and or hope for moral hazard and hope that people are going to bail us out again. This week, we gave $500 billion for college debt uh, prepay, uh, repayment that you didn't have to do. The president's approval rating is having its best bounce of Biden's presidency coinciding with a big fall in gas prices and oh we've got a 40-year low in the SPR there's another moral hazard there too we expect when things go sideways that somebody's just going to fix them before they get completely out of hand and just be patient and wait and the problem will go away that has worked until 2020 I'm just questioning whether or not that'll continue to work from here I would just add and completely agree with what Jim just said. Um, the history is undefeated in the track record of um, political expediency leading to monetization of political problems. And um, as Biden was facing a potential wipeout in the midterms, um, what did he do? The Orwellianly named uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which you know just pours gasoline on the fiscal fire, combined with a uh, constitutionally questionable edict to wipe out three to five hundred billion dollars worth of um, student loan debt, which is effectively a simultaneous monetization event, but also a bailout of a corrupt uh, and uh, utterly useless post-secondary education system in the United States, which is broken. Um, the the integral of the cumulative amount of student loan debt in the country um, should be measured against the um, comparative increase in the size of the endowments of the elite educational quote unquote institutions in the country. Um, all that money went somewhere. It went to Harvard, Yale and Princeton and, and their multi, you know, tens of billions of dollars worth of endowments. Um, that money, um, which never should have been um, put on the backs of uh, quote unquote students looking to get ahead in society and looking to leverage the, the uh, certification power of such post-secondary institutions. Um, it, it, it just, the, the 10,000th example of when push comes to shove, politicians will print. Um, um, Weimar happened for a reason. Um, and we're seeing now in the middle of, you know, um, massively negative real interest rates, um, the, the types of behavior that Jim is describing are simply because of the polling results. There is no courage in political leadership. So if you're, if you're modeling what's going to happen, uh, find the easiest path forward and assume that's what they'll do because um, that's, a, that's a sure bet as you can find on that. Hey, George, could I add something to what Doomberg just said? Go for it. Go for um, it. So I, I, I agree 100% along, and I think Nancy also echoed this earlier, that 
the Fed just talked tough today, and I get it. A lot of people believe the Fed and everything they want to say. But we all remember just, what was it, a year, year and a half ago, the Fed was saying they're not even thinking about thinking about raising rates until 2024. So what the Fed says today doesn't mean, Jack, doesn't mean anything. I mean, I get it. He gave a good little eight-minute routine in front of the microphone today. But when push comes to shove, deep, 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 in, deep into a recession, uh, unemployment going up, uh, the rest of the world falling apart, politicians starting to raise uh you know dish out the stimmy checks and unemployment benefits and expanded food benefits food stamps does anyone really think the fed's gonna keep doing this keep raising rates qt while congress is doing exactly the opposite to get through the next election i mean i just don't buy at all that the fed's gonna stay strong they don't have a history of following through with their statements why would we believe what he said today so I'm I'm with Nancy. I call BS on what what they're that they're that they're going to be so adamantly strong about raising rates in the midst of what's coming down uh, the pipeline right now. Just my my take. Yeah, I, Walter, well, I, I agree that we, we we talked earlier with Michael Guyad, and the the idea is you differentiate between path and prediction. Um, you know, we had a space last week with Joseph Wang, um, uh, Fed guy. Uh, you know, he used to work at the New York desk of the Federal Reserve. And to listen to him talk about the intermachinations of the Fed, uh, I mean, these, these are, this is the gang that can't shoot straight, right? I mean, he described it as being a civil service institution where there's no incentive for, you know, excellence or whatever. And, you know, when the, when the Fed, when Jerome Powell winds up being right about something, it, it, it's pure luck. It's a coincidence. This is the man without a plan. And I've used the analogy before of imagine driving down an icy covered road down a mountainside and the careening from one guardrail to the other, one constraint being too much inflation, the other constraint being they're afraid of putting the economy to recession and financial markets tanking. There is no plan. They're just kicking the can down the road, and there is no plan. And as Jim and Doomberg and others have been talking, we now have binding constraints. We have inflation. You know, the, the, Fed, the Fed can't produce more oil. They can't grow more wheat. I mean, they're running out of options here. And so you're going to see less good choices increasingly made as we go along. Um, to me, it just means, you know, this is, this is not, this is the antithesis. Of, <laughs> this antithesis, as Carpathia was saying, the great moderation, that's a distant memory, all right? Uh, and, and, and we're going to have this, this volatile stop-start environment, which is bad for financial assets. That's why we keep saying, you know, be defensive, reduce risk, be in cash, be short if you want to. But again, you know, being short for professionals, as we've seen the last few weeks, didn't exactly work out too well if, if one was short. But this year, those of us who have been negative absolutely killed it. Uh, and so it's a very treacherous environment. And I, I, what really outrages me, and I'm so happy about this space, that have people, so, so the cowboy we've had in here, trying to educate folks. Because the, the, the public is being fed a bill of goods by CNBC, Jim Cramer, Goldman Sachs. I, I will name names. You know, they always say you should, you should, you know, you can praise specifically, but you should criticize generally. Well, the hell with that, all right? I'm, I'm, this, this is, this is, this is an outrage, and I'm, I'm glad that we have people of the caliber of this room uh, who are able to speak out on this. So I want to thank all of you. I couldn't agree with you more. Listen, we've been going on. For, you, you know what's amazing about this room, Car well, Carpathia? You have one more thing you want to say before I close it, Carpathia? Ten seconds. One more thing. I think it was a board member of Archer Daniels said, "When chaos strikes, your experience and what worked in the past becomes liability." And what this room does is gives people the tools to use that's in a different toolbox than what worked in the past. That's it. Thanks for that. Listen, hey, George. Guys, yeah. Hey, George. Yeah, yeah Tommy. Yeah. Um, so, everyone, I just want to um, – I think everyone uh, should just give an applause to George. I hit him up uh, around 3 today, and I said, oh, my God, we got to do a space today because this market has – many so many elements to it and george you you just are a rock star you bring together the smartest people you allow them to speak you allow them to give opinions there's differing opinions on here but you give everyone the same amount of time to to give their their thoughts and these are really high level people i mean i, I hit up jim bianco and i said you got to come on he goes i will i'll be on and i hit up jim chanos okay and others. And by the way, George, 
I just, I, I'm so grateful that I learned so much. It's so diverse. The people on here are absolutely fantastic. And I just, I, I'm blown away every time I'm on one of these spaces. And, and by the way, everyone, it was supposed to be an hour and it, it's lasted three hours and it's been some of the best, um, maybe the, the best spaces you've ever done, especially how timely it is. So that's all I got to say. Tommy, you're embarrassing me and thank you for your kind words. I mean, yes, it's Thornton's fault. He called me at three o'clock and said, let's do this. Here we are two hours and 45 minutes later. We had as many as 2,200 people in this room at any one point in time. Any one of these speakers alone would, would command a huge audience as a keynote address at a conference. To have Thornton, Roke, Cantro, Belkin, Doomberg, Chanos, Bianco, Garbaz, KFAB, Davis, Guy had to make keep. I'm sure I apologize for those I, 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 I left out. This is unbelievable. And we're all doing this, you know, not necessarily any personal financial gain. We're doing it to try to help each other. Everyone has a different perspective, a different skill set we bring to the table. And I always keep saying we have the best spaces on Twitter because we have the best audience. We have the best content. We have the smartest audience. And so this is just absolutely fantastic. I want to thank all of you. We'll do this again before too long. Um, and, you know, stay safe. And uh, I want to thank you. And thank you, Tommy, for you to man. It's your fault. So take that. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Bye -bye. Tom and George. Great job. See you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.